metro.org, Community Progressive Radio for the Metropolitan New York area and the world, and this is Weekday World. I'm your host, Don DeBar. of some of the news and events of the past 24 hours from the CPR Newsroom. From Community Public Radio, this is the CPR News. From New York, I'm Don DeBar. Today, an update looking at the political landscape in Washington and around the world with our regular political contributor, Professor Tony Montero. If there's any word uh, that uh, singularly describes this moment politically in the Western world, by which we mean the major centers of capitalism in Europe and North America, it is the word chaos. Political unraveling, uh, political collapse. I mean, you just think of uh, the election in Britain, where, uh, by all uh, measures, the Labour Party was the victor. And uh, the Conservatives, uh, Theresa May leading them, uh, who called for this election to give them a strong political hand going forward in the Brexit negotiations, well, they lost. Uh, And uh, Theresa May's... uh, Uh, future, as well as the future of the Conservative Party, is on the line. And the one that everyone said could not win and was being opposed by all of the, if you wish to call them this, corporate neoliberal uh, folks in the Labour Party who opposed him, well, Corbyn comes out the winner. And he won by a combination of uh, working class votes In other words, uh, working class people coming back to the Labour Party and being activated by the program of Corbyn and young voters who, under the current regime of neoliberalism, uh, whether whether uh, Britain stays in the EU or not, but under the regime of neoliberal, have no future. And I think a lot of people voted uh, uh, to hold on to the uh, national health care system. And, and all of these things. So 
you know, it's so striking that within the course of a year, uh, the, Brit- the Brits in two elections have rejected the neoliberal elite. Some people said, well, this is a right wing vote, a racist vote, an anti immigrant vote uh, in the Brexit uh, vote. Well, what are they going to call this one? Right. Uh, so I think we're looking at political chaos. The same thing in France. We we can discuss that election as well. Uh, even though even the U.S. election too. I mean, on the one Absolutely. hand, people said that say that about people that voted for Trump, but a lot of those people were voting on the same issues that they voted for Sanders over, mm-hmm. and uh, they just you know were married to the uh, to an R instead of a D historically or whatever. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. so um, but the phenomenon, though, of, uh, you know, impoverishment of the working class and, yeah. uh, you know, an inflexibility of uh, structures to, you know, accommodate the needs of people resulted in this basically rebellion at the ballot box. And now you're looking at, you know, the moves in the U.K. You get Brexit. Then you get Elizabeth May, who well, uh, Theresa May, who really mm-hmm. was not a uh, strong advocate for Brexit. You have a loss, really, a reduction to almost zero of uh, UKIP, who sponsored mm-hmm. Brexit. And yet, at the end of the day, looking at today's Financial Times, even if uh, you, if May tries to negotiate or stall or walk away from Brexit, they're talking about you know a Brexit crash, basically, the, 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 the Britain crashing out of the EU. And in mm-hmm. other words... Even the things that are being done to thwart this rebellion lead to nothing but more rebellion and chaos. Absolutely. Absolutely. And even though the uh, uh, Western corporate media is uh, hailing the election first as president of Macron and then his win over the weekend, his party's win, if you want to call it a party. Right. Or uh, a win because it's only 31 percent. Right. (laughs) That's right. In the parliamentary elections, with the lowest turnout in recent memory, mm. if not on record, mm. uh, except which, for Puerto Rico, <laughs> we'll yeah, maybe that true. Yeah, that, right. yeah, and the United States, right? But um, people withdrew from all parties, and we can't forget that in the um, in the uh, first round of the presidential elections, uh, Le Pen and Malacone. Uh, Melacon being Especially. the hard left uh, small C communist right. uh, who was also uh, for France leaving the EU. Right. And and that doesn't even begin to talk about the 2015 uh, Greek election right. uh, or, 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 or polling, which showed that uh, the majority of Greeks wanted to leave the EU. Right. And now on the eastern flank, uh, Poland and Hungary are um, uh, are talking about leaving the EU. Right. And um, it, it looks bad uh, for the Western political system, the Socialist Party of France, the Venerable Party, which uh, under Hollande uh, gave in to neoliberalism of the Blair type in the British Labour Party. That party is effectively done. Right. Uh, and no one knows if it can come back. The same processes are taking place here in the United States with one important difference, and that is the United States uh, political system is uh, completely uh, organized and the state is completely organized around the project of U.S. empire and U.S. hegemonism. Uh, So... Here, the battle is less about, and I'm talking about at the level of elites, less about things like na- national health care and uh, jobs, and more about we have to get Trump out because he is a threat uh, to the continuation of American hegemony and America's use of uh, military power to uh, consolidate Uh, its power on a world scale. So this is what makes the U.S. situation different. But I think there is a a common logic, a common pattern of political breakdown uh, spurred on by the crisis of the neoliberal capitalist system. And I think uh, this is what we're looking at and this is where we have to look at it. 
Yeah, you know, um, I just heard an interview um, uh, with uh, one of the Sanders people um, mm-hmm. at, uh, I think it was Real News, um, and uh, this uh, the organizer from uh, Sanders' campaign uh, last year uh, was talking about, um, it was, she was asked by Paul Jay, yeah, it was uh, Real News, mm-hmm. about uh, the fact that it, uh, they had a, a recent uh, meeting of you know Sanders' uh, campaign people um, why there was no uh, foreign policy, uh, you know, items. There were no foreign policy items laid out uh, among mm-hmm. the issues that they were working and and in general, if you go, look back at Sanders during the uh, campaign, he didn't really lead on foreign policy. He was hitting a couple of notes uh, with respect to domestic policy over and over and over, and that was mm-hmm. really what was resonating, including getting people back to work. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> But um, you know the the foreign policy uh, items. Uh, you know th- this is such a bedeviling thing. You have you know all the we've been talking about this forever. All these people on the left that look at Trump as the next Hitler. You know they leave out the <laughs> fact that you know he's get, he gets elected essentially as chancellor or Fuhrer or whatever of the largest empire in the history of humanity. Mm-hmm. I, 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 it, it's that when he walks in. And he's talking about changing the approach so that so that it's not an empire anymore, but perhaps a collaboration or whatever his ultimate mm-hmm. vision is. But it's an entirely different beast and less of it's and not hegemonic, basically. Mm-hmm. And that mm-hmm. is the point of attack on him, certainly by the elite, of course, who have mm-hmm. constructed this you know hegemonic monster in the first place for their own benefit. Mm-hmm. But the left Mm -hmm. is also attacking him on it. When you see, Mm -hmm. you know, signs Trump with hammer and sickle and all the crazy Mm -hmm. stuff going on in it. So I don't know. How how is it that, um, you know, we're looking at the the biggest possible catastrophes for humanity uh, existing in the realm of foreign policy with the possibility of nuclear war, of course, and also just the decisions on how to construct the next order something is coming out of all of this chaos mm-hmm. can mm-hmm. we can we sit down and work something out where everybody can make money and you know feed each other you know just make sure everybody's fed clothed housed etc or are we going to do something else again well you know um we're looking at uh, contrasting universes uh i was listening uh, last night to the first part of Oliver Stone's four-part, four-hour, in fact, uh, interview with uh, Vladimir Putin. And it's really a contribution, uh, that is what Oliver Stone is doing, contribution to to world peace and against nuclear war. But what one clearly walks away, at least from the first part of this interview, is the fact that the Russian political system is stable. Uh, Putin is uh, has high public ratings, and in spite of all of the problems that they have, some of them uh, caused by uh, Western sanctions on Russia, the fact of the matter is, if you take Russia 20 years ago and you take it today, it is a whole different universe. Not only is the political system stabilized, but the economy is stabilized and there is growth. Uh, The military has been rebuilt. Uh, And there is general political and social order in Russia. Uh, Similarly, if you take China, political stability. Uh, China's uh, ideas go way beyond anything that any progressive government has ever put forward, at least in the modern uh, period. Uh, It sees a new kind of globalization, which is not based upon a unipolar world or uh, one superpower or uh, hegemonism. Uh, It is this one belt, uh, one road policy, the new Silk Road, if you will, uh, which is based upon adhering to international law, the right to self-determination, cooperation, and competition, but not uh, belligerency. Uh, so you get this stability among uh, non-Western nations, and this is like a magnet attracting uh, perhaps the majority of nations in the world. 
I mean, at the One Belt, One Road uh, Summit, uh, there were uh, close to 100 nations represented and 29 heads of state or heads of government. Mm. Uh, the uh, Asian Development Bank uh, that China is uh, at the forefront of is something that many, many developing nations uh, look to as against the IMF and World Bank. So the West as the major force in world events is collapsing. Now, that creates danger because uh, people who are committed to either a soft or hard coup d'etat in the United States might be adventurous enough to try to stoke some sort of major military confrontation in order to uh, 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 overturn whatever is left of constitutional government in the United States. That's what the danger is. And in the interview uh, with Oliver Stone, Putin was as clear as day about the danger of nuclear war and the movement of NATO military forces right up to the borders of Russia. Uh, and so I would say we have two distinct universes uh, that uh, are going in different directions. There are different logics underpinning them, uh, the East and the West. Uh, those forces who uh, perhaps are not yet at the level of advanced socialist development, but are certainly moving away from the path of capitalist development and uh, more than anything represent the forces of peace and peaceful coexistence and peaceful development of nations, irrespective of their political and economic systems. You know, what you're describing and, and, and what we're seeing, the rise of like the, the Eurasian giant. Um, yes. Mm -hmm. It kind of was a dress rehearsal in Latin America. Mm. And I would say also uh, two attempts um, in Africa, uh, mm -hmm. beginning perhaps around the time of Bandung and, you know, in the mm -hmm. aftermath, uh, where, uh, let's say, uh, in the case of Latin America, uh, with Hugo Chavez and, of course, the inspiration and assistance from uh, Castro and the Cuban Revolution uh, and the example of some others. But... Uh, Taking a look at trying to organize uh, the, the Western Hemisphere south of El Rio Grande um, into a uh, self-defense, self-sustaining, self-development, self-determining, um, you know, block where mm -hmm. uh, multiple systems, you can have whatever system you like in your country, but let's agree to protect each other's sovereignty, right to self-determination. Let's try to integrate transportation and other fundamental economic structures and uh you know we can do with them as we wish individually but let's look at each other as being an essential part of our ability to stand up for ourselves and so mm -hmm. you had um these first uh, like-minded states in the alba group for example and uh you know that was the bolivarian uh you know group mm -hmm. but then you mm -hmm. end up with unasur with salak in between with unasur just you know if you're in latin america or the caribbean join unasur and we don't care what kind of system you have economic mm -hmm. political whatever we will stand and defend you if if somebody comes mm -hmm. in from the outside etc cetera, etc cetera. and you know with the economic uh, uh, alliances that were formed, even those nations that were, you know, had strong ties to the United States, very right-wing governments, had hostility to the Venezuelan model or even uh, mm -hmm. Brazil or Bolivia or Argentina's model at the time, they felt compelled to engage because they were bringing back goodies to their populations that they wouldn't be mm -hmm. able to explain not having in any mm -hmm. other way. In other words... But just by the sheer force of example and of the economic benefits being so obvious that 
yeah, I don't care that it's a socialist country we're engaging in a partnership with and I'm a military dictator. Let's go do some business with these guys. We're going to be bringing mm-hmm. some stuff home. And mm-hmm. China is, you know, to, to Venezuela in that role, like, you know, not even an 800-pound gorilla. It's like a colony mm-hmm. of uh, gorillas that have evolved into super beings or something. It's, you know, mm-hmm. it's huge. So, mm-hmm. you know, their code is uh, win-win. Yeah. And the U.S. offers, we're going to take your stuff and uh, make you carry it to our boat. Yes. And, and you know, the other thing is, and it's a very central part of this, to create a world that is indebted to the Western banking system. Uh, and this is what has undermined, in a lot of ways, economic and political developments on development on the African continent, uh, less so in Latin America. Uh, but the breaking of the Western financial stranglehold over the world economy is as important. And what goes along with this is the rise of other currencies as reserve currencies. Mm-hmm. You know, the dollar is has been and to a certain extent remains the currency through which nations trade uh, with each other. Uh, The dollar is like gold, but in this situation also means that the nations of the world are financing U.S. indebtedness. And in a certain way, the U.S. military's uh, attempt to dominate all over the world with the decline of the dollar relative to other currencies, even the euro, but most importantly, the renminbi, uh, uh, this makes nations less dependent upon Western financial uh, institutions and, and in particular, the central banks of the West. Uh, yeah, let me so, let me just let me just uh, say yes, something for, mm-hmm. to clarify a point yes. for people, mm-hmm. because you're talking. This is so true. N- not mm-hmm. only um, you know in in places that that is commonly discussed, but the uh, power of uh, Western uh, banking system and the hold of the Western currency played a large role in breakup of the Warsaw Pact. There was mm-hmm. there were loans that were given particularly to Poland. And then suddenly the spigot was turned off and demands made for payments and it sent the, the economy into crisis and it never recovered from it. Mm-hmm. You have that. And then the danger, the threat to the hegemony of the U.S. dollar, um, both in Cote d'Ivoire, where mm-hmm. they were just threatening the franc at that, the French franc, saying, well, we're going to print our own currency. Absolutely. Ends up with France occupying Cote d'Ivoire and Gaddafi talking about and sh- moving towards a gold-backed dinar for Africa as mm-hmm. a currency, mm-hmm. and we know what happened to him. That's right. That's right. And we could add to that the crisis and eventual coup d'état in the Ukraine had to do with whether or not the Ukraine would become dependent upon Western banks and therefore become a neo-colony, an indebted neo-colony to the West. Uh, and um, uh, the former, the, the elected president, the legally elected president, whose name I don't recall right now. Yanukovych. Uh, Yanukovych. He, uh, he, in fact, uh, was uh, ambiguous about going full steam uh, towards uh, the West, which meant towards uh, the euro and uh, the banking system of the West. So, yes, this is a huge thing. And in, in some ways, you know, Don, we can look at these world relationships from the standpoint of currencies and the global financial system and its possible breakup uh, Looking at it from that angle, and I'm, I'm suggesting that that's not the only way to look at it, right. but it's one way to look at it. One can see uh, the, uh, the stakes and how high they are. Uh, and this is, this is reflected even 
in the Brexit negotiations with the Macron government taking, as it were, a hard line against Britain and and challenging whether or not the city of London, which is uh, uh, the UK's uh, Wall Street, whether or not the city of London will remain the major financial center in Europe. Uh, Macron and, and Angela Merkel, the French and the Germans, are saying if, you, if the Brits leave, leave the EU, uh, the EU will establish uh, its own centers of, uh, of finance and of clearing uh, financial deals among parties and among nations. And that would be a huge blow against Britain. Uh, the question is, well, where does Britain go if not to the EU? I mean, uh, the, other, the, the, the only other option as a major partner would be towards the U.S. Uh, but that doesn't look like uh, it has much promise given the political uh, chaos in the United States. So, uh, again, when you look towards China and Russia uh, uh, and the Eastern countries, the Asian uh, countries, uh, we see something completely different. And I think these differences uh, is what defines this moment uh, in the history of the world. And then there's there's some distinctions that uh, exist between uh, the economy, say, of uh, the U.S. and um, what they call the trilateral economy, which, you know, mm -hmm. really means just the U.S., Japan, and the EU, more or less. I mean, South Korea, I guess, too. Um, so it's now quadrilateral. Uh, mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, out of that block, and not so much uh, Japan and South Korea on this point, but particularly the United States, vis-a-vis -vis China, where, okay, well, um, uh, you know, the Chinese corporations, a lot of them, 51% state-owned, 49% privately owned, lots of those shares held by people in the United States and the EU and, you know, J Japan and elsewhere. And so... On the one hand, there is the, you know, the sense, the logic that uh, probably there's some weight in terms of uh, policy making inside the Chinese government, <clears throat> you know, on, on behalf of these uh, owners. On the other hand, China can look at these people and say, basically, look, we have the factories. You have some paper. Tell you what, you keep your paper. We're going to keep the factories. And, oh, no and, and, you know, and that whole the whole uh, virtual economy, which is pretty much what exists on this side, um, you know, collapses. They have so much of our paper, it's not, you know, a majority of it. I, I don't even know if it's mm -hmm. in double digits, but it's such a, you know, large uh, factor that it can certainly, you know, if they dump their paper, the prices mm -hmm. start to collapse of everything. And of course, if they just say, you know what, we don't honor those stock certificates anymore or those joint venture certificates or whatever the hell the instruments are that uh, represent o the ownership of the Chinese economy by foreigners. If we don't honor that anymore, that's that. These guys th don't have the wherewithal to make cars or airplanes or whatever, whatever else mm -hmm. we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Well, and the other thing is, in a situation like China, the question that has to be asked is, who controls the commanding heights of the economy? Right. Um, the banking system is completely state-owned or state-controlled. Uh, and all of the strategic areas of the Chinese economy are, uh, are state-owned. That is to say, a majority of the stock in them are owned uh, by the state. Right. Uh, so going forward... To explain China's uh, rapid growth and what it's doing now internationally, uh, we have to look at the structure of the economy and how it is not based upon the principles of neoliberalism. Right. In fact, the Chinese economy is state capitalist as opposed to the, quote, free market model or neoliberal model in the United States and the rest of the West. And I would say if you look at the two systems, at this point, the state capitalist model uh, with conditionalities of going to socialism uh, is winning the economic competition with the West. And of course, it's most attractive to most uh, uh, developing 
nations uh, in the world, including places like Hungary and Turkey and the Philippines, uh, certainly North Korea. And uh, most of Africa has no choice but to move in that direction. And as you point out, Latin America, of course, with all of the problems produced by this U.S. uh, uh, encouraged and financed crisis in Venezuela and Brazil, uh, I think that's going to be uh, short lived. And um, and once that is overcome, we will see the processes uh, resumed of a moving towards a anti neoliberal and a state uh, capitalist model of economic development. And finally, and we've only got like a minute and a half, but um, mm-hmm. we, uh, if, if you think about uh, the possibility of whether it's Trump or some other uh, person who comes in to shake things up, mm-hmm. uh, certainly it's time for a paradigm shift here in the United States. It's going yes. to come about whether it's through collapse or through construction. Uh-huh. Um, and so, you know, talking about throwing a trillion or two dollars at infrastructure <laughs> development, um, you know, that that could be a part of it, but that's not going to be policy. That's going to be, you know, a uh, particular act. And I'm wondering if there's some kind of uh, policy uh, inclination in the Trump administration or without the Trump administration towards uh, constructing this kind of a state capitalist uh, structure. Yeah. And, and I would say the way it looks now would be without a Trump administration. Um, you know, in a lot of ways, uh, Trump was a bellwether. His election indicated uh, a political discontent at the base of the Republican and Democratic parties. So it might be without a Trump administration, and it will certainly be a multi decades process. And hopefully, it will be the path of politics rather than the path of civil war uh, going forward. However it comes, there will continue to be political chaos. And whether the country becomes ungovernable is a whole nother question that would be difficult to predict at this time. Professor Montero, thank you very much. Pleasure is over. Thank you, Don. And that's all the news we have for you right now. For Community Public Radio, I'm Don DeBar in New York. Thanks for listening. Hello and welcome to Crosstalk, where all things are considered. I'm Peter Lavelle. The regional and international standoff headed by Saudi Arabia against Qatar is not going to be resolved anytime soon. What does this simmering crisis mean, and why has Donald Trump taken the Saudi side? Crosstalking Saudi Arabia and Qatar, I'm joined by my guest in Beirut. We have Sharmin Narwani. She is a journalist as well as a Middle East geopolitical analyst. And in Tehran, we cross to Fouad Izadi. He is a professor at the Faculty of World Studies at the University of Tehran. All right, crosstalk rules in effect. That means you can jump in anytime you want, and I always appreciate it. Uh, Sharmin in Beirut. Um, you know, right before Donald Trump w- went to Riyadh, oh, there was this chatter and all this talk about an, an Arab Sunni NATO. Well, I guess that's not working out too well now. Then we've had this diplomatic spat in which a number of Sunni countries have uh, uh, cut relations with uh, uh, Qatar. A blockade has gone into effect. Demands are being made. Um, I have to ask the, the, the most obvious question here. Um, with Saudi uh, direction, are they trying to force a regime change in Qatar? Because um, we've seen this spat that's been simmering for a long time, and now it's come to a head. And given the very poor road record of, Soviet, uh, of Saudi foreign policy over the last few years, I'm thinking of Syria, I'm thinking of Yemen, um, I'm just, I guess, expecting the Saudis to blunder again. Go ahead. 
Well, the Saudis want a capitulation of some sort from Qatar. You're right. This this uh, um, difference of opinion on a variety of things between Saudi Arabia and Qatar have been going on for a long time. But why now? I mean, I have to say this is what's perplexed me more than anything: the timing of this. You know, Qatar was with Saudi Arabia. Uh, sorry, was in Riyadh with you know 54 other Muslim nations when Trump visited. There were no particular signs of animosity. Um, Qataris have spoken to have said they're shocked. I think the crux of this actually goes back to Syria, where I think the whole region has converged and differences have emerged. Um, you have in Syria now uh, Qatar and Turkey as one block. You have the Saudis, Emiratis, and their allies another block. And then you have this third block, which is Syria, Iran, and Iraq. Um, and, and in the last month, you have seen things shift which perhaps have not been reflected in the, the media headlines. Um, when the Americans told the Turks they could have no part of the operations in Raqqa, the Turks understood that the Americans were looking to create a little Kurdish state in the north. And they collaborated, I believe, with their Qatari allies. Um, and in this last month, we have seen um, all the, the Qatari and Turkish-backed groups suddenly go really quiet in Syria, which allows the Syrian army to focus on the Iraqi, their border with Iraq, and on ISIS, which has not pleased the Americans. So mm -hmm. I think the events of the last month, quiet though they have been, have triggered um, this uh, this line in the sand drawn by the Saudis and Americans. Juan, if I can go to you in, in Tehran, I, I, you know, if I were sitting in Tehran right now, I would be looking across the uh, the Persian Gulf and saying, well, when there's a circular firing squad, why get in the way? Just watch, okay? Because um, the way things are going, one of the criticisms that, uh, that have been lodged against Qatar is they're too close to your country here. So I guess cut diplomatic relations, create a blockade. Oh, I guess it would make uh, Qatar more friendly with Tehran not uh, ha to have such an acrimonious relationship like Saudi Arabia would like Qatar to have. Go ahead in, in Tehran. Yes, I think you're right. I think uh, what the Saudis have done is uh, to push uh, Qatar into the arms of Iran. They have uh, blockaded uh, Qatar uh, on three sides, uh, south, east, west. The only uh, way uh, Qataris can go out is north, and north is looking at Iran. Uh, Iran has been sending uh, Qatar uh, plane loads of uh, food and other uh, necessary items uh, every day uh, from uh, Tehran and Esfahan and Shiraz. We have uh, planes going to Qatar. Um, uh, Iran is actually taking advantage of this. Uh, Iran does not want to see a GCC that is united against it. Uh, Iran uh, does not like to be fighting uh, people in Syria that are funded by Qatar. Um, the general idea in Iran is to improve actually relations with all the neighboring countries. Uh, Iran doesn't really want to be fighting Saudi Arabia. Yeah. Saudis have a lot of petrodollars and uh, the idea is to actually, uh, Rouhani's government at this the uh, idea is to um, basically improve relations with all the countries, and Qataris seem to be ready for that, and Iran is more than ready to do that. So, I mean, um, it's really odd. I mean, we, we look at the, um, uh, this uh, simmering conflict escalating here, but um, half of, uh, of the Gulf Council countries have some kind of relationship with Iran, and they're not being penalized by Saudi Arabia. Uh, there are trade ties. Um, it, it, it seems to me that, again, maybe they got the cue from Trump, that you know, Trump is giving them the green light, and the tweets seem to uh, suggest as much here. But that's looking at the, your region, your neighborhood, in very black and white terms. And I think most intelligent people would say, well, it's a little bit more complicated than that. Go ahead. I mean, it's true. Where's the scrutiny at, like, Kuwait and Oman, for instance, right. that enjoy good relations with Iran? Um, the UAE, for that matter, uh, Dubai views Iran quite differently than Abu Dhabi. Dubai has a huge Iranian expat community and does a lot of trade with Iran. So, um, you know, I think of, the, again, the 55 uh, Muslim nations that were invited to the summit in Riyadh, um, the vast majority of them want to keep peaceful relations with Iran and don't 
don't want to um, create an antagonistic front against that country. Um, which is why I think there's much more to the story than, than what we're reading and the narratives that are prevalent right now. Um, and I do think a lot of this falls on in Syria because uh, they, you know, if you look at the Syrian military theaters right now in the north and around Damascus, um, and for the last month as well, Saudi-backed groups and U.S.-backed groups have been fighting um, Qatari and Turkish-backed groups. So this is why Oman and Kuwait, for instance, may not be implicated, but Qatar absolutely is. You know, uh, Juan, if I can go back to you in, in Tehran, what you know, is uh, big in Western media about this story, if it's ever get mentioned, because uh, it's only about Russia, 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 at least in the United States. Um, you know, uh, it, the, the issue of terrorism, okay, and we've all heard the, the mantra in American media that Iran is the greatest export of terrorism. I mean, they just say it over and over again. It's like hitting F1 on your computer. But I find it really um, uh, pitifully laughable that Saudi Arabia is accusing Qatar of exporting terrorism. Um, Qatar doesn't have cl uh, clean uh, hands on this, and the Saudis certainly don't. But it gets good traction in Western capitals, and most importantly, uh, uh, Saudi-funded think tanks. Go ahead, in Tehran. Um, you are right. What we are um, seeing is that uh, two countries are accusing each other of supporting terrorism. And in fact, in the last many years, both uh, have been doing that in uh, Syria. We have a mess in Syria because of the funding uh, that comes uh, from Saudi Arabia. And Qatar um, has contributed to that funding to uh, different organizations that are um, basically fueling the civil uh, war there. As you know, the Saudis are also funding a lot of think tanks in Washington, yep. and Qatar is also uh, more or less doing that. So a lot of um, uh, uh, scientific, quote-unquote, scientific or scholarly material that, that you see published in Washington is actually uh, funded to achieve some uh, political aim. Uh, Iran is uh, telling the other sides that maybe uh, both countries need to rethink their uh, policies towards Syria, uh, rethink their policies of uh, fueling uh, terrorism. Uh, Qataris seem to be listening. Uh, the Qatari foreign minister had a statement uh, a couple of days ago saying that they actually were sorry uh, for engaging in the Yemen war, uh, which has also killed a lot of civilians. Uh, so Qataris are realizing that their policies in Syria, their policies in Yemen, their policy with regard to fighting Iran is not paying off. Uh, and the Saudis, unfortunately, uh, are doubling down on these wrong policies, uh, and uh, they're spending a lot of money, billions of dollars, uh, bribing a lot of countries. You saw yep. uh, eight, nine countries uh, cut relations with Qatar, and, and a lot of those countries are actually depending on the Saudi money, and they're basically at the service of the Saudi directions when it comes to their foreign policy. The Saudis have a dictatorship inside their country, they seem to want to create a dictatorship yep. in the region. Uh, even they uh, do not uh, tolerate uh, dissent from the uh, leaders of an independent country, neighboring country. Okay, let me go back to Beirut. I think it's really quite interesting um, that there are so many junctures where we could have a change of strategy. Um, I think some of the ideas that Qatar has about having a, a, a more egalitarian politically situation in the Gulf and vis-a-vis -vis Iran is rational. Um, it probably keeps out other foreign powers. Um, but, you know, we have a new president in the United States, and he's just doubled down on the same old tired policy of really listening to Israel in one ear and listening to the Saudis in the other year. And we know that for decades that has not worked, but it seems to be the same strategy, except for it's on steroids now. Go ahead. You're, you're absolutely right. Um, you know, we're kind of looking at another divide globally. Um, countries that seem unable to get off old trajectories, old foreign policy trajectories, even though times have clearly changed. And then you have this new spate of countries that have found sort of a new alliance over the um, conflicts going on in the region that are absolutely open. Um, to diplomacy and the use of soft power and negotiation. And, you know, for instance, us in Astana, 
and Kazakhstan. We've seen um, some countries that had adversarial relationships at different points of, uh, uh, of the last few years come together, Turkey, Russia, and Iran. Yep. And, and this is the way forward. Yep. Yep. There's no resolution of the, the, the Saudi Qatari spat um, except through diplomacy or um, use of force. And that's not an option I'm hearing very much about, Charmaine, but I don't see why me, it's let me not being considered. Let me, jump in here. let me jump in here for a second, because I think you made a really good point right there. And these talks that were happening in Kazakhstan, it, no wonder things were going well, because the United States wasn't calling the shots. It was other countries that came together, not under the preamble of Washington, because Washington always determines the outcomes. If it doesn't get the outcome it wants, it will not uh, help a, a situation be resolved. I'm speaking directly about the situation in Syria that could have been easily solved if the United States had been cooperative instead of been, uh, being obstructionist. Um, I, l listen, I absolutely agree with you. And um, one really good thing about what's come out of Syria and Iraq and, and, and the big fight is that um, U.S. hegemony, U.S. power is shrinking rapidly in this region. Okay. Um, on, they're, on, they're going to have to start to point, agree we, to things. We have to go to a hard break. And after that hard break, we'll continue our discussion on Qatar and Saudi Arabia. Stay with our team. Welcome back to Crosstalk, where all things are considered. I'm Peter Lavelle. To remind you, we're discussing the standoff surrounding Qatar. Okay, now we're joined by Mohammed uh, Shukarwi in Washington. He is a professor of conflict resolution at George Mason University and author of What is Enlightenment, Continuity or Rupture in the Wake of the Arab Uprisings. Mohammed, thank you for joining. I understand you heard a good part of the program in the first part. Um, one issue that I think is really interesting in all this is that the United States has one of the most important military bases in its possession sitting right in the center of Qatar. And we have Donald Trump siding with the Saudis, and we have American troops sitting in there. Um, I don't think, given past Sau Saudi behavior, reckless behavior, I would underline that, that there is a, there, it could be a possible military move, and American personnel are sitting there. Again, I wonder if anybody in the White House in Riyadh thought this through. They usually don't. Go ahead, Mohammed. Well, it seems to be a good test for the Trump foreign policy to experiment with this needed reconciliation between classical alliances with the Arab world, especially the Gulf and Qatar in particular, and the new paradigm of counterterrorism. And it seems that the Riyadh meeting was a strong trigger event of this new conflict between the Emiratis, the Saudis, the Bahrainis, the Egyptians on the one hand, and the Qataris on the other. And I'm asking myself, is this a time, a high time for an implosion of the GCC? Yeah. Apparently, there is this strong push for counterterrorism and isolation of Qatar, but at the same time, there is a missing half of the currency yeah. or the, the other side of the coin. We don't know where this strategic alliance with Qatar is hidden, and I think this is a $64,000 question. You know, let's, let's go back to uh, Tehran. Well, I think it's very interesting is that, you know, I, I truly believe that the region can take care of its own problems all on its own uh, if it was allowed to. And we haven't seen that. We've seen colonialism, neocolonialism, and we've seen what we have here today. But what's really interesting with this spat with Qatar, that it is actually bringing in more outsiders, though not so far away. Um, Iran does play a role right here. Turkey may be sending troops to Qatar. Oh my goodness, a NATO member. Oh, that makes the, the, this makes it even more sweeter and more complex here. Um, and of course, Russia has offered its good services to, to negotiate. It can talk to everybody, not, and the U.S. cannot always say that. I mean, so is this a kind of a new wave of maybe a, a broader regional approach to start resolving these problems because and it, can they be a mediating force on Saudi Arabia because Saudi Arabia just seems so thick-headed and stubborn and not it just doesn't see reality go ahead in Tehran I think we yes I think we can um, uh, derive two points uh, with regard to what's been happening in the last 10 days or so here 
one point is that you know, the Qatari government has been in the service of the United States for many years. Sure. They paid a billion dollars, built a yep. military base, and just gave it to Americans. We have about 11,000 American troops stationed there. And this is a signal for other U.S. allies that uh, you get a president like Trump or you get some establishment that for some reason doesn't like you, and they just forget about all the services that you have provided for many years. This is a sign that you cannot really trust the Americans when it comes to foreign policy because Americans, it seems, don't know how to do foreign policy. The president says one thing, the Rex Tillerson says something else. There's a big mess going on in Washington. So this is point number one. The second point that I think is very important is that historically, the GCC and the, the southern part of the Persian Gulf has been ruled and influenced by the British. And, and uh, you really don't see UK playing a big role in what has been happening in, in the last couple of weeks. Um, Russians are playing a role. The Turkish, as you said, are playing the role. Iranians are playing the role. So I think we are uh, having a paradigm shift. Instead of relying on the Americans and the British to uh, sort out difficulties. We are having a much more diverse number of countries pushing out the traditional colonial powers. And I think this is actually a welcome news for everybody here. Sharmin in Beirut, what, another thing that I, I find very worrisome is what, how does Saudi Arabia de-escalate? Uh, can it? I mean, look what it's doing in Yemen. Okay, it doesn't work, then keep doing it. Doesn't work, keep doing it. I mean, this is what bothers me the most, is that they, they won't be, they, they, they don't have a nuance. Every great power, what makes them great is that they have options. And I see the Saudis just narrow and narrow and narrow their options. It's irrational. It is against their national interests. Go ahead. This is, I, I agree with you, this is very worrisome because in, in um, sort of recent years, very recent years, um, we have actually not seen Saudi Arabia back down. Um, and uh, it's, it's a new kind of Saudi Arabia we're seeing because certainly with, you know, the last king and the ones before them, a, a line of, um, of brothers and half-brothers who've... Uh, essentially understood their position in their region. Sometimes they would be in a position of strength and other times more vulnerable. And they have, they have explored things like diplomacy um, in a way that we're not seeing with this Saudi Arabia that seems to be run by the, the, the aging king's um, son, the deputy crown prince, or uh, crown um, prince, Mohammed yeah. bin Salman. So it's a different kind of energy. I'm not sure if we, we will see Saudi Arabia back down, which is why I have brought up earlier in the show that we may see a situation where force may be used in um, this scenario or another one. You know, Mohammed in Washington, you know, uh, we, we discussed in the beginning of this program, I posed my first question, is that um, do the Saudis have in mind a forced regime change in, in Doha? But you know, it's not impossible, it's not impossible to conceive that, that the, the entire Saudi royal family is at, at even more risk now by going out and taking this risky action. I mean, the Saudi economy is not, I mean, okay, they went on a buying sp uh, spree of a third of a trillion dollars, but they're facing a lot of very serious problems in their economy. And, you know, and now they go on these foreign adventures um, where, where they have their colleagues in the council and they're, they're not, well, they will go along with it, but you know, the, I don't see a whole lot of enthusiasm. I think the, 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 the royal house of Saud is putting itself at really perilous risk. Go ahead, Mohammed. I think we have two issues here. First one, there is a dominant group thing, uh, belief or, you know, across leaders in Riyadh where they look at the whole region and the whole U.S. Gulf relations through the prism of of you know counterterrorism on the one hand and on the other i think there is also this overcapitalization in future trump's foreign policy as if they are you know investing in him to be their guy and to restore the power of their influence in washington and beyond and i think this is where 
I am asking myself, was it the Trump factor or probably the Trump curse that mm. brought us to this escalation with irrational thinking? Yeah. It's a paradigm of real politics that has no nuances of the Gulf relations. On the, on the other hand, whether the Saudis, the Emiratis will push for a regime change in Doha, I think it's too far. I mean, we are maybe pushing the envelope, but what is certain is there has been an attempt for the last three years how to contain Qatar and how to undermine the underdog that has outperformed the big guys in yeah. political, diplomatic, and also media influence. I think this is where this and eve relations and the egos, there are inflated egos now that are talking about the elimination or the isolation. What I am afraid of is that how far we can push Qatar because now we are paving the way for two regional powers to get into the Gulf, the Turks and the Iranians. And I think there will be time when the uh, uh, Saudi leadership will realize that it will no longer uh, you know, uh, hold or, you know, uh, it will no longer be able to do anything. In other words, the, uh, the Turkish and the uh, Saudi influence will be within the border of Saudi Arabia, which is perceived to be their number, and especially, you know, Iran. Right. So I think now we are bringing this new Shia Sunni uh, conflict to the border of Saudi Arabia. You know, Fadi, that's very interesting what we heard from Mohammed. I mean, when, when you compare, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about the tweets that Donald Trump had about your country and terrorism, and, and then, then, then the kind of tweets that they, he had before the election about Saudi Arabia. I, I, can you give me a sense of the regional thinking here? I mean, I mean, the, this is very two different mindsets. You're coming from the same man over the course of six months, okay? What has happened? And in, in the capitals of the region, I mean, what's the level of trust? Because you know, we don't know what a, for, a Trump foreign policy is. All we know is it's very confusing rhetoric, and his underlings are not saying the same thing he is. This is very destabilizing. Go ahead, in Tehran. Yes, you remember the campaign that uh, Donald Trump several times said that ISIS was created by Hillary Clinton and uh, Barack Obama. In fact, one time he was asked, uh, what you are saying is that the U.S. foreign policy contributed to the creation of ISIS and his answer was no I meant that they established uh, ISIS they created ISIS uh, so this is what he said uh, six months ago and now we have a terrorist attack uh, in Tehran and uh, he is uh, tweeting in a manner that is uh, disturbing especially to the families yeah. uh, of the victims of this terrorist Sh attack shameful. blaming shameful. Uh, the shameful. victim for shameful. Uh, very, very much blaming the victim uh, victims of, of this terrorism uh, for, for an entity that uh, six months ago he was saying that the US government created. Uh, so this is terrible sum. I think the major dif differences, difficulties that we have here is not a fight between Shias and Sunnis. Um, uh, I think it's m more a geopolitical fight, a political fight. Uh, this uh, issues of uh, traditions and sectarian uh, ideas are used uh, to advance geopolitical uh, difficulties that countries have. You know, Iran uh, has been supporting Hamas for uh, many years. Hamas uh, is actually a Sunni organization. Um, Iran's policy has been to support uh, organizations that are uh, fighting uh, hegemony, either Israeli hegemony or American hegemony in this part of the world. Uh, and if uh, uh, Sunnis do that, Iran supports them. If Shias do that, Iran supports them. In fact, the support that Iran is giving to Qatar now is, is uh, Qatar you know, is a Sunni country. Uh, so th this is not what, how Iran thinks. And I don't think the Saudis uh, are interested in Sunni Islam. They're generally supporting Wahhabis, which are not Sunnis, they kill Sunnis uh, on a daily basis, uh, and they are also trying to advance their foreign policy. The only problem is that they, the, the, the activities, the actions that they're, they're taking is actually hurting their foreign policy. Okay, I'm going to have to jump in here. I'd like to notice that their interests are for, uh, the interests of the royal family. I think that is very, very clear. We've run out of time. My, thanks to my guests in Washington, Beirut, and in Tehran. And thanks to our viewers for watching us here at RT. See you next time, and remember, Crosstalk Rules.
From the studios of Radio Sputnik in downtown Washington, D.C., it's loud and clear. We take you inside the news five days a week. It's happening, and it's happening now. I'm Brian Becker. Attorney General Jeff Sessions has testified in a public Senate Intelligence Committee hearing. What did he say? Donald Trump celebrates his 71st birthday as a political civil war continues to engulf Washington. We take a look at a life marked by extreme bigotry, extreme privilege, and dumb luck. The diplomatic crisis among Gulf monarchies continues to develop rapidly. Qatar has hired George W. Bush's Attorney General John Ashcroft as its lawyer and for, quote, crisis response. What's next in the rift in the Gulf? But first, we turn to the Jeff Sessions hearings in Washington. We are joined from Seattle by Jane Cutter. She is the editor of liberationnews.org website. And from Baltimore, Maryland, by Kevin Zies, the co-director of Popular Resistance. That's popularresistance.org. Welcome back, Jane and Kevin. Thank you for having me. Hi, Brian. Kevin Zies, to uh, quote Shakespeare, much ado about nothing. What did you think about the testimony by Jeff Sessions? Yeah, much ado about nothing is a good way to describe it. This is a, the Russia Gate story, really. Uh, we are, you know, there's so much innuendo and uh, inadequate proof of claims being made, you know, from the beginning to end. And Jeff Sessions and his testimony really just continue that. Uh, there was no meeting at the Mayflower Hotel, the third meeting, supposedly, uh, that people were accusing. It didn't happen. His previous discussions with uh, the Russian ambassador were not substantive. Uh, They were kind of brief meetings, it sounds like, that didn't discuss anything about uh, the elections in the United States as far as Russia taking any kind of actions. And so this has become a partisan show. Uh, You know, we've seen Democrat-related nonprofits organizing protests around the country calling for investigations. Uh, we already have a, a special counsel, Robert Mueller, mm-hmm. conducting an investigation. And I have criticisms of Mueller. That's a separate question, which maybe we'll have time to get into. But really, so far, there's not much really to uh, to go on. And uh, the, you can see the Mueller's investigation moving away from Russiagate and more toward obstruction of justice, uh, which I don't see that much there either, uh, frankly, at this point. Maybe more will come out, but so far... Not much. Jane Cutter, you know, the Trump administration right now in the last weeks has tried to lift all of the protections that would help safeguard the environment. They're trying to get rid of Medicaid, trying to get rid of that part of the Affordable Care Act that had many advantages, including the expansion of Medicaid. In other words, a plan that would deprive 24 million Americans of health care coverage over the next 10 years, according uh, to the Congressional Budget Office. Uh, immigration raids, mass roundups of immigrants. I mean, just a lot to protest against Donald Trump, and yet the Democrats are really almost entirely focused on a campaign that seems to have no there there. I mean, you had Jeff Sessions uh, recused himself as attorney general from the Russia investigation. Last week, James Comey, the now-fired FBI director, said during his testimony before the same Senate committee that Sessions testified, quote, we also were aware of facts that I cannot discuss in an open setting that would make his, that's Jeff Sessions, continued engagement in a Russia-related investigation problematic. So we were convinced, and in fact, I think that we'd already heard that the career people were recommending that he recuse himself, that he was not going to be in contact with Russia-related matters much longer, and, he tr- and that turned out to be the case. Now, it seemed to me that that's the thing, Jane, that really made Jeff Sessions want to testify before the Senate Intelligence Committee, basically to defend his own name. I mean, there's not much else that came out of yesterday's hearings. 
That's right. And before I go further into it, I just want to make one thing perfectly clear. Jeff Sessions is a vile bottom-feeding racist. Let, let there be no confusion about that. But as far as these accusations, right, there, it's nothing but innuendo. And uh, the most they could get out of him was uh, he attended a, as a member of a, an advisor to a campaign, he attended a reception. And then they got into a long, uh, drawn out, it seemed like they were talking about how many angels could dance on the head of executive privilege. Um, and they kind of went back and forth about that for a long time. But, you know, I, I really uh, almost got sick to my stomach at the beginning when Sessions was pontificating about defending the democratic process and the importance of protecting the democratic process from things that would attack it, because he has a long, career-long history of seeking to undermine the voting rights of African Americans. Yeah, Kevin Zies, that's so true. I mean, let's help the audience also remember that when Jeff Sessions was nominated by Ronald Reagan to be a federal district court judge in Alabama. He couldn't even get through the Senate at that time because of his overt anti-black racist comments. And then he's been the chief xenophobe, anti-immigrant sort of cheerleader while he's been a U.S. senator from Alabama and now uh, leading, again, these terrible ICE raids. I mean, these vicious raids that are arresting people who have been in the United States 30, 35 years, breaking up families, arresting grandfathers. I saw this these Iraqi grandfa- Iraqi American grandfathers who are being busted in Detroit in the last couple of days because they had a minor violation from 30 years ago. That's Jeff Sessions, but that's not what the Democrats in the Senate are going after Jeff Sessions for. I mean, it really is, did you meet with the ambassador? Did you fail to tell uh, your colleagues that you met with the ambassador? Of course, the Russian ambassador to Washington meets with high-level U.S. senators all the time. I mean, it is fundamentally routine and yet now any contact with Russians, I, I saw the New York Times had, a, had an article that says Trump's advisors ties to Russia the other day. It was seven of them. Roger Stone's ties that they could cite was that he had a Twitter connection with an online Russian blah, 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 oligarch or something. That's right. No, you're, you're exactly right. And uh, like Jane, I, I'm, not a, I'm not a fan of uh, Jeff Sessions. That's for sure. He's kind of the opposite of what I would stand for if I was attorney general. And I'm not a fan of Donald Trump, but he's doing many things wrong. But the, the, this is a diversion from debating those issues. And I think the Democrats are diverting because they are the minority in both houses, and they have very little power. What this Russia Gate investigation accomplishes for the Democrats is it ties Trump up uh, in a, a, a very big side issue that's required in the higher lawyers, required members of his, of his administration to hire lawyers, requires his daily attention. Uh, you know, there's only a certain amount of time in the day. If you're focused on defending yourself on these false allegations, or these, these allegations without any, any factual basis so far, um, we don't know they're false yet, but so far I don't see anything. Um, it, it just, you know, sucks up his time and makes it impossible for him to do uh, his job. And maybe that's a good thing that he can't do his job because what he would be doing we'd be all disagreeing with. And, and so I think the Democrats are using this as a, as a strategy. But I think it's a dangerous strategy because in the end, maybe they'll get Michael Flynn on not reporting some income. Uh, you know, maybe they'll get, you know, another one or two members of the campaign, you know, to, uh, you know, on minor charges, not reporting various things, not registering as a foreign agent or something. But there'll be minor charges. Um, and, and in the end, the Democrats will look like they were playing partisan games with a very important issue. Russia is an important country. Uh, you know, they uh, are a major economy the size of Germany. They are a nuclear-armed uh, country. Uh, they play major roles in key parts of the world, uh, yeah, Syria, Iran, and other nations. They, they say, and, and, and so uh, creating conflict with Russia over false allegations or unproven allegations of them trying to undermine our elections uh, is damaging. It's damaging to the world and to our foreign policy. So I find it to be this whole, this whole thing to be a, a, a shameless diversion uh, that is taking us away from really confronting the issues that both Trump and Sessions are putting forward. I worry about Sessions. Uh, he you know, now has a secret group talking about how to undermine the 
progress being made on marijuana policy. And so we can start to see more arrests in Colorado and other states if, uh, if, if that goes the direction it seems to be going. On issue after issue, Sessions is wrong. But the Congress, the Democrats need to find a way to stand up to them in Congress, debate those issues, win those issues. Uh, but the problem is the Democrats just are not that good on these issues. They, you know, on health care, they are afraid to say improve Medicare for all is our policy, even though more than half the Democrats in the House have signed on to John Conyers' expanded and improved Medicare for all bill. The Pelosi is trying to push it back to the states, which is a counterproductive move to actually achieving the goal. So the Democrats don't want to stand for anything because they're afraid to stand for something. And so for them, it's much better to wrap Trump up in these unproven allegations. That's an excellent point. Jane, you know, when the, when the Democrats did have control of the House, which they did in 2009 and 2010, they had the control of the Senate by big majorities in the Senate and the House, and they had a popular president, Barack Obama. They could do anything that they wanted to do. No, nothing could stop them at that time. And they did do what they wanted to do, which was to put, pass the Affordable Care Act, which was to give, you know, private insurance companies another, I don't know, 20 or 30 million people who had to pay them money and taxpayers who had to subsidize these private insurance companies. There were some advances, but it, it wasn't Medicare for all. They could have done that then. And so now you have the, the situation where the, Rus- the Democrats are focusing the liberal public attention against the crime of having, wanting to have good relations with Russia, which is now called colluding with Russia because there's no evidence that there was actual Russian meddling. Maybe there was, but there hasn't been any hard proof given. We have a situation where James Comey said he was, when he met with uh, Trump the first time in 2000, January 6, 2000, uh, 2016, right after the election, right before Trump became president, he was the one who cleared the room of all other people. And he told Trump about the salacious details of a so-called, you know, was, Trump was with hookers or something in Moscow. And he said it wasn't Trump wasn't under personal investigation. Like he said that to Trump. Then Trump cleared the room the next time he wanted to talk to Comey and he cleared the room. And and that was a a few weeks later. And then suddenly Comey is saying, I didn't feel secure being around Donald Trump. I had to memorialize all of my interactions with Donald Trump. And yet all Trump was actually asking Comey to do was to leak the news that Trump wasn't under personal investigation. I mean, it seems to me that Trump made a huge political error by firing Comey. He completely miscalculated. He thought Comey's firing would be applauded by the Democrats because the Democrats hated Comey, too, until now when they love Comey. I mean, it seems to me just uh, the Democrats are doing everything, as Kevin said, to, to dodge the real issue and create false it's, this is a false issue. Well, absolutely. Uh, I couldn't agree more, Brian. And if the Democrats were uh, in Congress were actually truly representing the interests of the people of this country, they would be fighting uh, against everything that Sessions is actually doing as Attorney General. They would be fighting for the rights of the undocumented. They would be fighting for immigrant rights. They would be fighting... To, uh, they'd be fighting against Trump. They'd be fighting to expand, truly expand Medicaid for all. And instead, like you said, they're focusing on this false issue. And all of a sudden, like you said, they love Comey. And so let's not forget exactly who Comey and the FBI are, which are horrible criminals who have, uh, you know, com- committed numerous crimes against the people going back for generations. Uh, they have undermined. They have undermined the democratic process in this country and the civil liberties and civil rights of countless people. And they are no heroes, no principled leaders. The way they all of a sudden Comey has turned into this uh, hero. We're, we're just about out of time, Kevin. I want to ask you a follow up question along the lines of what Jane is talking about. You are one of the principal leaders of the Occupy movement in Washington D.C. at Freedom Plaza. That was uh, Mueller, who was the FBI director at that time. They did everything to shut down Occupy. 7,000 people were arrested. He did a lot of other things like rounding up Muslims after uh, September 11th. And yet now you have fake movement groups like Move On, which is really just a front for the Democratic Party. Unlike the genuine grassroots resistors, they're now acting like Comey and Mueller are these great bastions and guardians of democracy. And that's the big danger, because now Mueller has license. I mean, he has power. 
He has budget. He has FBI investigators. He has lawyers. He's hiring a bunch of lawyers who donated to the Hillary Clinton campaign. And he has the power now to take this where he wants. Remember Whitewater? The Clinton investigation was a land deal and ended up as a sex in the White House investigation. We don't know where Mueller's going to take this. And so this could go on for two years. Uh, it, could, it could meander to all different issues, more scandals, more diversions, and we don't know where it's going to end up. And, and that's very dangerous, I think, that the, the, uh, the, the FBI now uh, has a, and, and the Department of Justice uh, has an a, a independent special counsel who can take this anywhere. It's very dangerous. And Mueller has a terrible record on post-9-11, on helping to build up the false intelligence to go to war in Iraq, on anthrax, where he made a false arrest, cost the United States $5 million in damages, on, on rounding up 1,100 Muslims after 9-11, on in, infiltrating peace groups and infiltrating the Occupy movement and other movements along the way. This is not someone we trust. This is not someone who has ethics. This is someone who sells out and protects the, the ruling uh, elites. That's what he's done his whole career. And the ruling elites right now, they've been wanting this for more than, you know, more than the Trump era. They, going back to Obama and even Mitt Romney's campaign, they've wanted conflict with Russia. Jane Cutter, we'll give, you the, we'll give you the last word in 45 seconds or so. Where does it go? And what do the people who are resisting, like you, who are the grassroots resistance against Trump, I mean, what are you doing right now? How do you differentiate from this phony, false reactionary, I would say right-wing resistance against Trump that's being carried out in Congress? Well, I'm planning on going to the People's Congress of Resistance in Washington, D.C. on September 16th and 17th, and I hope other people who are in the resistance, the true resistance, will go there, too, because I think we all need to meet up with each other and formulate a real program and a strategy of resistance that's going to be effective and not uh, get sideswiped, sidestepped by all these diversions. Yeah, I agree with you. And I think Kevin's right. Following the Democrats right now is following Mueller, following Comey. That's just plain dangerous uh, for progressive people, because following them means they can take you all kinds of places that will ultimately be the opposite of something progressive. Anyway, we're out of time. We've been speaking with Kevin Zeese and Jane Cutter. You are listening to Loud and Clear. We'll be back. Loud and Clear. This is CPR Metro. Loud and clear. You are listening to Loud and Clear. I'm Brian Becker. Donald Trump celebrates his 71st birthday today as a political civil war continues to engulf Washington, D.C. We take a look at a life marked by extreme bigotry, extreme privilege, and Maybe just dumb luck. We are joined from Atlanta by Anoa Changa, the host of the weekly show, The Way with Anoa. And she is also the deputy director of Impact. And from Florida by Ben Weaver, also known as Ben America. He is the political director of Impact. Welcome back, Anoa, and welcome, Ben. Thank you. How are you doing? Glad to be here. Great. Thanks so much for joining. Anoa Changa, I was looking at a Ted Rawls' graphic biography of Donald Trump, and it says, Everyone in America thought they knew Donald Trump, the real estate magnet, reality TV star, and bigger-than-life personality, lived his life in the tabloids. Little did they know, though, as he hinted at repeatedly, that he planned to take American politics by storm. Well, that certainly did happen. Uh, Donald Trump, with the great, great, great assistance of the mainstream media, which made him a thing, is now the president of the United States. When you think about Donald Trump, the man, what do you think about? Um, I think that's absolutely right, Brian. When, you, when, when traditionally, when folks have probably thought about Donald Trump, I've thought about, you know, basically Biff from Back to the Future, right? Some, you know, larger than life millionaire with, you know, extravagant tendencies and a shooting off at the mouth, not someone to be seriously taken or taken seriously on, on the political scene. I mean, certainly not someone who would be leading the alleged free world, even though it seems like the free world is now revolting against American leadership under, um, you know, his presidency. Now, when I think about Donald Trump, I think about someone that is a, a basically, that is still a quagmire of, um, I don't know, various eccentricities. But um, I, I don't know that I quite expected some, him to operate 
entirely the way he has during this election cycle and even, you know, now actually in terms of quote unquote running the country. But um it is it is definitely a, a very convoluted and and uh interesting presidency and, and legacy he's he's beginning to build um in the political world. Ben I know is absolutely right. I mean nobody could have actually predicted how he would operate, but let's look at how he operated I mean, the moment he came into office, he tried to fulfill his campaign pledge to ban Muslims. He tried to put a legal fig leaf on it, saying it wasn't a ban on all Muslims. It was just a ban on seven majority Muslim countries. That made tens of thousands, perhaps hundreds of thousands of people take to the streets, go to airports, occupy airports, and eventually both the federal district court and then the appeals court ruled that that was unconstitutional. Uh, He said he would get rid of the American, the Affordable Care Act. That's just become a gigantic explosion within the Republican Party because they can't agree on how to get rid of it. Then he had the firing of James Comey, the FBI director, who he thought everybody would applaud the firing of Comey because the Democrats hated Comey too much. I mean, he's got a lot of problems. He's got a lot of enemies, obviously, both at the grassroots and within the summits of the Washington establishment. But Donald Trump is an unusually bad political leader, and it seems like he's just maybe not having as much fun as he predicted he would be having. If white supremacy could bear offspring, it would look like Donald Trump. From his hair to his management style, he represents the, all of the things that are wrong with the way that our country um, glorifies greed, and it glorifies, it, cre- it, it labels success as the exploitation of other people. And having seen what he's done since he's been in the White House, he's demonstrated that. He's demonstrated privilege, and he's demonstrated a worldview that is isolationist. And it's not just isolationist as it relates to our foreign policy, it's isolationist domestically. And the danger with that is, is that as we begin to isolate ourselves and individualize ourselves more, we lose that power that America was built on, which was our ability to collectively work together to create great things. I know uh, uh, Donald Trump is the son of Fred Trump. He was a, quote, business success. He was also a racist. He made sure not to rent or sell to black or Latino people in New York City. Uh, Donald Trump had a very a blessed youth. I mean, he was born with a silver spoon in his mouth. His father left him an inheritance worth either $40 million or up to $200 million. Then in the 1990s, Donald Trump went basically bankrupt until 70 banks bailed him out. And then he was just considered a mid-level real estate mogul loser until he became the head of or the, the show host of The Apprentice, Again, a show organized by Fred Zucker, now news producer or central CEO at CNN. He was brought back to life by the same people who are now crucifying him at CNN. And again, it's all it seems to be all about business. Yeah, I mean, I really do think just follow what Ben said and what you just pointed out. I mean, I really do think this also shows like the problem over the last. 20, 30 years with the way, the nature of the way business has been done in terms of the financial industry as well as the news slash entertainment industry because so much of our news is carefully curated to evoke certain reactions and emotions and not necessarily just to inform. So although we slam Fox News for being just really just like some perverse type of entertainment, I mean, really when we look at the way CNN and MSNBC have been increasingly curated a certain way, I mean, arguably the same thing can be said for those those outlets and others as well. I mean, we, we've talked about this before, Brian, the CB with the head of CBS saying, you know, Donald Trump was good for ratings. Um, I mean, the, the way that news programs have now been ratings driven, maybe this was always like this, but it, it seems like particularly in the past five years or so, it really has been a greater increase in news programming, delivering high ratings and making money, which then lends to having outlandish and outrageous folks like a Donald Trump be the ones to get the attention and focus. The other thing that you touched on in terms of his upbringing, um, being in New York, being a racist, you know, his father being a racist, him, what's really interesting is it's not that 
you know, we only know these things now in the modern era because of, you know, social media and, and, and Google and technology and stuff. Like, this is not stuff that was hidden. This is not stuff that was unknown in the 80s and 90s about Donald Trump. I mean, when he took out that, that ad in all those papers against Central Park Five, so everybody knew exactly who Donald Trump was and what he was doing. And yet, political elites, like, within the Democratic Party, like the Clintons, even, you know, the who's who of hip-hop and other folks, did still choose to engage with him because we have a tendency, and I say we euphemistically, just Americans in general, have a tendency of excusing, you know, the behaviors of the rich, of folks like Donald Trump, as just being eccentric or outlandish, or just as people excuse Bill Maher for being, oh, well, he, yeah, what he said is bad, but he talks badly about everybody, and that's a similar type of way that people dismiss Donald Trump. Donald Trump says whatever he wanted to say, but he said whatever he wanted to say about all types of issues across the board, so it was excused for decades. And so we now have him as not only the leading contender for president, but now actually as the president of the United States of America. He is the Frankenstein built by Democrats who took money from him and associated with him, by political and other social elites who allowed him to exist, and by the news networks and, and, and the, the, the networks in general that gave him space and time for the last however many years, even before he ran for president. Yeah, I I agree with you completely. In early 1989, Trump took out a full-page ad in the Daily News, that's a leading New York City tabloid, about the Central Park jogger case in which five young black men were charged with carrying out a brutal rape of a white woman who was jogging through Central Park. It turned out none of it was true. They were forced to confess by police brutality. They were very, very young. And Trump took out a full-page ad calling for their execution. Of course, later they were exonerated. And he wrote in that full-page ad, How can our great society tolerate the continued brutalization of its citizens by crazed misfits? Criminals must be told that, and this is all caps, their civil liberties end when an attack on our safety begins. And then it's the, the headline was, bring back the death penalty, bring back our police. Okay, so that's the same message, Ben, that Trump is doing in the 2016 election campaign, calling Mexicans rapists, calling immigrants undocumented folks who are working here as a bunch of criminals, saying that we have to build a beautiful wall like Israel's wall against the Palestinians along the Mexican border and make Mexico pay for it. And also, of course, the extreme misogyny where the tapes came out, where Donald Trump has talked, obviously bragging about sexually assaulting women and how he can do it because he's rich and famous. And yet CNN, CBS, all of them gave Trump nonstop 24-7 coverage like it was great recreation. This would have sunk any other candidate, but this was a different, we're, we're in a different ball game. Trump spoke to the fetishes of the right wing and he spoke about those issues nonstop. when he was pulled off of message he would pivot back to those fetish points and he would hit those again and again and again and he would say these lines in a time where politically correct language is being treated as something that ties down the individual. And, this, and it's, it's a natural course of events. His message speaking to the, the, the right wing that wanted to see their, their, their idea of society return, this leave it to beaver concept of what society used to be, it was really driven by fantasy in the first place. He is a fantastic candidate in terms of he is based in fantasy. His support really is also based in fantasy. We're seeing, it, uh, we're seeing it wash away now. And what we will find in the long run is that we will look back on this and see what happens when the politicians and the people that are supposed to be representing and are supposed to be doing the work, the service, the public service, when they give up that obligation uh, to get power and to enrich themselves, then they create an environment where a charlatan can step in and, and just create a complete fantasy, and people are more willing to believe in that than what is real. Anoa Chenga, I want to ask you about the Democrats, because Donald Trump is making outrageous mistakes. He's shooting himself in the foot over and over again. 
he even challenged the outcome of the U.S. election that he won. I mean, it's so odd. I mean, he actually lost the popular vote by three million, but won the won the electoral vote. But then he went on and on and on about how if it hadn't been for voter fraud, he would have won the popular vote, too. In other words, he's such an extreme narcissist that the fact that he won the election but lost the popular vote meant that he had to create these fictions. And they are fictions. There weren't three million fraudulent votes. When you see the whole thing unfold, and it's almost every day, obviously Donald Trump could be, you know, really taken to task for almost anything. The Democratic Party could very well take him to task because he's destroying any protections for environmental regulations, anything that inhibits the extreme maximization of profit. He's destroying the environment. He's loaded his cabinet with oligarchs, right-wing oligarchs and generals. He's carrying out the destruction of health care for millions of Americans. He's trying to uh, take food stamps away from people or charge people who use food stamps a higher fee, in other words, another tax just to get food. And at the same time, the Democratic Party has decided to focus on the Russia connection with Trump rather than all of these social and economic and environmental issues which are actually affecting millions of people. So in a way, this theater, and that's what it really is, this theater is really playing itself out daily where Trump, because it actually, if passed, would mean millions of people would lose health insurance. That really didn't matter to them. This is a circus. What do you think? Oh, I absolutely agree. Particularly now, you know, everyone cheered when that when the Senate refused to take up the House version of the, what is it, the AHCA or whatever they're calling it. And now, you know, their draft is being released and it's like just as, you know, disturbing. So... It would, it would be great to see the Democrats, you know, really, like, rally around some of these very strong points. You do have some folks talking about Medicare for All, but it's certainly not enough. There are some murmurings that Senate Dems are willing to kind of go easier in terms of health care because they want bipartisan support in terms of the Russia investigation. And it's like, the, again, you know, Nina Turner spoke on this maybe a couple of weeks ago, like, yes, you know, investigate, determine if there really was some type of, you know, improper behavior. I mean, because it's, it's really unacceptable if, you know, the head of the country has engaged in, in inappropriate behavior with, you know, leaders of other nations to undermine, you know, democracy and voter integrity. However, we have a systemic history of both parties undermining democracy and voter integrity through our election process. And if they're really serious about concerned about democracy and voter integrity, we would really see a more robust attitude and approach to, um, and not just this little commission or whatever they're, they're creating uh, uh, to, to, to respond to Trump's uh, voter integrity commission, but led by now governor, gubernatorial candidate from Kansas, Chris Kobach, but like a real serious effort to address the aging voter system that we have in this country, as well as the, the millions who have been disenfranchised through cross-check voter ID um, rules that look at taking people off polls if they haven't voted in recent elections, all types of stuff. And Democrats are often silent. I'm actually meeting with a, a, a woman later today um, who started this group called, this organization called Spread the Vote that's looking at addressing, um, you know, issues in terms of voter suppression. And one of the things that she said when she spoke at an event here in Georgia three weeks ago was that, you know, as a, as a long-term Democrat, she went to the Democratic Party where she was, and she was like, these issues are happening, you know, we need help. And they were silent. And she, she decided to start her organization because she knew that she couldn't rely on any particular party to do anything. And I think that's how people feel all across America. And folks are looking for leadership in this time. Um, Everyone says work local or organize or whatever. And people are really looking for leaders, for voices to help them, you know, have some guidance and direction. And unfortunately, for the most part, Democrats are really falling down on the job. Trump is an absolute disaster. The Republicans have been a disaster since they took over the House and the Senate. Um, you know, when, 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 when the majority was lost in 2010, they've been a continuous disaster. Their approval ratings have been lower than Democrats, and yet they continue to still beat them because Democrats have not unified around a real message that resonates with American people. And they're not organizing. They're not leading. They're just pointing fingers and whining about how Bernie is overstating his welcome in the Democratic Party. OK, we're going to have to leave it there. We are completely out of time. We've been joined from Atlanta by Noah Changa, the host of the weekly show, The Way with Anoa, and Deputy Director of Impact. 
and from Florida by Ben Weaver, also known as Ben America. He is the political director of Impact. You are listening to Loud and Clear. We'll be back. Loud and Clear. You're listening to CPRmetro.org. Loud and Clear. You are listening to Loud and Clear. I'm Brian Becker. The diplomatic crisis among Gulf monarchies continues to develop rapidly. Qatar has hired George W. Bush's Attorney General John Ashcroft as its lawyer and for a crisis response. What's next in this rift in the Gulf? We are joined from London by Masoud Shajare. He is the co-founder of the Islamic Human Rights Commission. Welcome back, Masoud. Thank you for having me. Thank you for joining. John Ashcroft, well, we all remember John Ashcroft when he was the Attorney General after September 11th. He was the the architect of what was called then and still called the Patriot Act, which was basically, I don't know, stripping the U.S. Constitution of any pretense towards democratic rights if the government so chose to rescind them. Uh, during the, the commencement of the so-called War on Terror Ashcroft was right there, front and center with George W. Bush and and Cheney and Rumsfeld. Now he's been hired by Qatar. Tell us what he's going to be doing. Well, it really is very bizarre. Um, and uh, it, it, you couldn't really write stories like that. It, it's it's really is uh, very, it really is bizarre. The whole episode that uh, how um, the, just after the visit of uh, Trump into the region, we actually had this sort of uh, conflict unleash in what uh, was uh, up to then, at least on the surface, a uh, sort of the uh, sort of unity among the Gulf states. And now it, it's uh, sort of Qatar is trying everything. And uh, on one side, Qatar feels uh, threatened if U.S. really turns uh, uh, away from it. And it feels threatened by Saudi Arabia, which always have been. Qatar has uh, over and over, even uh, the father of uh, President King was on the record as saying that one of the reasons allowed the United States to actually have uh, bases in Qatar was because he was uh, scared of invasion by the Saudis. And it seems that, again, this present sort of uh, ruler is also looking to find solution to its uh, difficulty and uh, and, and uh, sort of this blockade and sort of aggression against Qatar to United States. And uh, it's actually going to pay millions to see if he could sort of buy favor or indeed have someone to maneuver some sort of support back to Qatar away from the Saudis uh, and I, I really um, don't know um, how um, sort of realistic this is to sort of uh, think that, uh, you know, getting someone from the sort of Republican sort of party will be influential in trying to actually open up some sort of way for Qatar into favor of Trump. Yeah, it's, um, it's kind of a perfect picture of modern day imperialism. The imperialist arm... Saudi Arabia, they give them constant money, uh, constant arms. They encourage their wars like the war in Yemen. They are partners with Saudis. And then the Saudis do something like threaten Qatar. And the royal family in Qatar reaches back to one of the leading personages in the imperialist edifice and pays him a lot of money, $2.5 million to be friends. That's a flat fee to John Ashcroft, $2.5 million. He's, he doesn't need a stipend. $2.5 million flat fee to cover his firm's first 90 days of expenses on the project, quote, given the urgent need to commence work. That's the language of this agreement between Ashcroft's law firm, between the law firm of the former U.S. Attorney General under George W. Bush and the Gulf uh, monarchy, Qatar, to help it in its struggle against Saudi Arabia, again, backed by the United States and backed by Donald Trump, who's congratulating them. He's actually taking full credit. He said afterwards, after he came back from Saudi Arabia and after this rift opened up, after Saudi Arabia tried to isolate Qatar, that 
that he now knows that the he could see the light at the end of the tunnel that the the world struggle against terrorism was finally coming to an end now that Qatar is on the defensive and he Donald Trump did it i mean the whole thing as you said is surreal but at the same time a perfect image of sort of the decadence and the the nature the fundamental nature of modern imperialism Absolutely, and and uh, you know Donald Trump is, seems to be playing that sort of the role of um, sort of very aggressive, a very heartless uh, businessman who is just seeing the whole of the sort of Gulf region as a, a sort of a possibility to make a buck or two, and and sort of basically clean up uh, the sort of excess uh, um, sort of funds in Saudi Arabia and then Qatar and then getting them uh, sort of to start wars, strengthen wars, do more in Syria, do more in Yemen, do more um, against one another and then possibly dragging um, sort of Turkey into it and etc. It really is, uh, is bizarre and, and uh, you know, it, it, uh, what in reality it means, it means chaos, it means conflict, it means uh, fueling um, sort of old uh, sort of conflicts and uh, what it really means is suffering for ordinary people not just in the Gulf of state but far beyond that and I really think that this is uh, playing with fire and actually creating a conflict further in that region where uh, we know it, it sort of uh, it, once you start a conflict be it in Iraq or Afghanistan or Syria or elsewhere, then to sort of uh, find a solution to it becomes impossible. You know, any fool could start a, and uh, start a war and conflict, but uh, you know, it takes a lot to actually try to find solutions afterward. Indeed, very easy to climb the escalation ladder, very hard to get off of it because you can go- take each step unilaterally, and then the other side will ma- match you. But to get off the escalation ladder, to to de-escalate. Uh, people have to move more or less at the same time, and that takes a lot of synchronization. Very, very hard. And that, as you said, Masood, is the way bigger wars start. I want to talk about the other sort of geopolitical fallout of this development, Saudi Arabia trying to isolate Qatar. And, of course, Saudi Arabia has the support of most of the other Gulf monarchies. Reuters reported last weekend, quote, Iran has sent four cargo planes of food to Qatar and plans to provide 100 tons of fruit and vegetable every day, Iranian officials said amid concerns of shortages after Qatar's biggest suppliers severed ties with the import-dependent country. Help the audience understand why Qatar is so vulnerable to a boycott, and also, uh, does this show some kind of realignment between Iran and Qatar? Of course, that would have been something that would have been hard to have imagined a little while ago. I, at least I would have thought it would be. Maybe I don't know enough. Help us understand that. One of the reasons Qatar is so vulnerable, Qatar hasn't got a facility for uh, very large containers to actually sort of to, to bring food and uh, goods into it. And in past, it has gone to the Emirates and then sort of offloaded there and then... Uh, sort of uh, redirected with the smaller um, ships into Qatar. And currently, the Emiratis and the Saudis and everyone else is actually refusing to provide that services. And uh, I believe uh, only a couple of days ago, uh, Oman offered to provide that service for Qatar. And so, uh, but again, Iran is um, sort of just across the Gulf and it's capable of providing and is capable of providing sort of fresh food and so forth from the produce of of Iran and uh, they have actually come forward to do so. I think what is really happening is that uh, many people, including Qatar's and to some extent Oman and to some extent extent um, Dubai Emirates, uh, it's uh, they are. Uh, quite concerned, including Kuwaitis, are quite concerned of the aggressive sort of uh, style of the Saudis and uh, their 
local politics and uh, sort of the way that they are pushing their weight around in that region and indeed trying to push that weight around within the Muslim world. And people feel um, sort of quite vulnerable that uh, if Qatar is dealt with, you know, it might be Kuwaiti's next or it might be Oman's next or it could be, you know, already there is a conflict with Iran. And uh, so as much as they don't want to be contributor to sort of fueling these uh, conflict further, they're actually quite worried and they don't want Qatar to be taken out um, in this way which will give Saudis more power and more resources and more money and probably, you know, sort of resources of Qatar as well. Um, so Iran's involvement in helping is quite um, sort of natural in, under these circumstances. But also we see that uh, Turkey is offering a, a very useful and very positive helping hand. And indeed Oman and Kuwait have uh, really refused to become party to Saudi's aggression and policy with regard to Qatar. And so is playing this uh, role of mediation because doesn't want to actually take a uh, side and, uh, well, doesn't want to take the uh, natural side of uh, Saudis. So we are seeing realignment of um, sort of... Uh, uh, some of the local uh, governments and local, local countries. And uh, I think uh, that is uh, sort of uh, very helpful to Iran and is very helpful um, to sort of trying to stop uh, what, what some observers are saying, the, the sort of the madness of the young prince in, in, in Saudi Arabia and, and uh, is, is sort of very aggressive uh, militaristic sort of policies in the region. Right. So Turkey's parliament, Turkey's parliament approved a bill last week that would allow troops to deploy to Qatar, setting up a military base in the country in which 3,000 would initially be sent. Let's just spend another minute or so about the Turkey-Qatar relationship. You have Turkey and Iran, and now we know Iran is also helping Qatar in its struggle with Saudi Arabia. Turkey and Iran, along with Russia, at some point became the guarantors for the peace process in Saudi Arabia. That, of course, would not have been something that the United States would be very happy about. Turkey, of course, is a U.S. NATO ally, the eastern flank of NATO. Al Jazeera reported yesterday Russia's President uh, Putin has also warned in a phone conversation with the king of Saudi Arabia that the blockade against Qatar by its neighbors would make it harder to reach a peaceful end to war in Syria. Putin and King Salman bin Abdelaziz al Saud quote, touched, this is Al Jazeera, touched on the aggravated situation around Qatar, which unfortunately does not help consolidate joint efforts in resolving the conflict in Syria and fighting the terrorist threat. Well, Saudi Arabia doesn't really want to resolve the conflict in, Sa in Syria. But talk about how this realignment is shaking out. And is it, of course, everything that seems to be not durable right now in that region, everything that seems to come together sort of melts into the air, uh, all the different alliances keep shifting. But is there a possibility of a, of a genuine sort of long-term realignment, or is this just maneuver and shadow boxing? Well, I think if we look at uh, realignment of the sort of uh, countries in the region, it started long before uh, the current situation of Qatar. You really need to look back at the time of the coup in Turkey. Um, if you remember when the coup took place, Russia's relationship with Turkey was very um, low and very negative. And then during that coup, uh, it was very obvious that Russia actually helped uh, Turkey and uh, it was observed that uh, indeed it was warnings were given by Russia and immediately the relationship between Turkey and Russia changed almost 180 degrees. And, uh, and, and also at the same time, many observers were uh, saying that this was also connected to the situation of Qatar because uh, Saudi Arabia uh, was said to be involved 
um, uh, directly or indirectly with the coup in, in Turkey. And uh, it was actually thinking that once that coup takes place, then that will weaken uh, Qatar, which has been relying on Turkey for a very long time. As a matter of fact, there is... Um, there is a, a, a sort of a, a military presence of Turkey in Qatar as a means of protecting um, Qatar against Saudi Arabia. So this um, uh, realignment was there for quite some time, and some observers saying that this is also to do with the gas pipes going to go through um, uh, through Syria and Turkey and so forth and so on. Um, but the fact of the matter is that we have seen a um, sort of a gradual shift in realignment and that has now been strengthened with the situation of Qatar. And it goes back to the whole issue that uh, many people in the Middle East now look at uh, one, the prince, uh, young prince in Saudi Arabia is very aggressive, very arrogant, very sort of military reliant on, on, on any sort of policy rather than uh, diplomacy and their relationship with uh, very obvious, uh, very uh, clear relationship with um, Israeli state. And uh, the fact that uh, it actually wants to be dominating the whole area as very aggressive and very unwarranted for the long-term tranquility and peace of not just Syria, Yemen, um, who are in midst of crisis, but the rest of the states, including Kuwait, Oman, and even uh, places like Dubai and so forth. All right, we have run out of time. We've been talking from London with Masoud Shajare. He is the co-founder of the Islamic Human Rights Commission in London. You can follow their work at ihrc.org.uk. That's ihrc.org.uk. Thank you, Masoud. We will be back tomorrow. Be sure to go to our Facebook page, Loud and Clear with Brian Becker, for daily updates. If you enjoy the show and you want your friends to hear it, let us know by liking the page on Facebook. Remember, telling the truth is important, but to make a difference, it has to be loud and clear. We are out of here. Loud and Clear. Earlier today, the European Parliament discussed President Trump's announcement that the U.S. would withdraw from the Paris Accord. Mrs. President of the Marshall Islands, Monsieur le Président de la Commission européenne, Minister Dalli, dear colleagues, the Paris Agreement has been a historical achievement of the international community. The first ever global commitment to address climate change and these consequences. While we regret the decision taken by the United States of America administration to withdraw from this agreement, our long-standing commitment and determination to lead global action on climate change must not relent. We, Europeans, will not miss the opportunity that the Paris Agreement represents for our citizens, for our planet, for our economy. Tackling this global challenge also entails working with our industry for new investments, for new technologies, and for more sustainable growth and jobs. The European Parliament has been at the forefront of climate action within the European Union. And today, there is an important vote on this. Our overwhelming vote in favour of this agreement made possible its ratification and entry into force. We must be proud of this achievement. And we must also continue to work with the United States, its companies, states and cities in this and other fronts. We have set ourselves the most ambitious target in the world. We have the most advanced legislation, which we are strengthening now, showing our continuous commitment. We were fundamental for this global agreement. 
as we were able to forge a strong alliance between developing and developed countries. This multilateral spirit was fundamental for the success of the COP21. And for this, I want to thank Commissioner Cagnete and the European Commission for the strong engagement in this issue, in which the nations of the world, big and small, united to defend a higher cause. Today, we have the honor to have with us Mrs. Hilda Heine, the President of the Republic of the Marshall Islands and Chair of the Eight Ambition Coalition. Madam President, you know very well the effects that climate change can have, especially in the most vulnerable. Your testimony today is of almost importance for us. Mrs. President, you have the floor. I bring warm greetings from the people and government of the Republic of the Marshall Islands. It is indeed a great honor and privilege to address you today. Ladies and gentlemen, I come from a country whose beauty is as breathtaking as its vulnerability. Our ancestors refer to our islands as Jolet Jananich, or gifts from God. Midway between Australia and the United States, the Marshall Islands comprises more than a thousand islands dotted within 29 different atoll chains, often no wider than a road. While our territory, mostly ocean, is vast, our population is about 50,000, far smaller than this beautiful city. It would seem that my country and yours could hardly be further apart or more different, but there is much that we have in common. On a personal level, some of my ancestry is European, German to be specific. On a national level, we are strongly committed to liberal democracy, to human rights, and the rule of law. And like the European Union, my country also believes deeply in a multilateral approach to solving global problems. The gravest of these is the battle against climate change. We are all vulnerable to climate impacts. No one can escape. But the Marshall Islands is on the front line. Wherever you stand in my country, you see the ocean. With an average elevation of two meters above sea level, we have nowhere to run and nowhere to hide. King tides and droughts have become more regular and frequent, with disaster often hitting us in different ways in different parts of the country at the same time. One of my first acts as president was to declare a state of disaster because of an unseasonal and prolonged drought. We had less than three weeks of fresh water left. At the very same time, we were on high alert for widespread inundation. The drought lasted seven months and cost us nearly 3.5 million euros. The year before that, a typhoon wiped away more than 3% of our economy. And the year before that, many of our people were left homeless by a single king tide. Climate change is not a hoax. This is what the everyday struggle against climate change looks like. For us and our Pacific Island cousins, the oceans that has been our lifeblood risks becoming the cause of our nightmares and through no fault of ours. 
unless the world keeps its promise to pursue efforts to limit global temperature rise to no more than 1.5 degrees Celsius, my country and others like Tuvalu and Kiribati risk becoming completely uninhabitable before the century ends. But the current geopolitical situation would seem to make achieving the 1.5 degrees limit more challenging than this time last year. In the 18 months or so since the historic Paris Agreement was reached, the world seems to have been turned upside down more than once. The leader of the world's largest historical contributor to climate change has announced that he wants to leave the Paris Agreement. In my view, that decision was at best misguided. It was also disappointing and confusing for those of us that have long believed in the importance of U.S. global leadership. This is particularly so for my country, a long, long time committed ally and friend. In the coming three years before the U.S. can legally withdraw, we all have a duty to work together to convince President Trump of the importance of climate action. And we have compelling arguments and evidence to help change hearts and minds. Because of that, I'm cautiously optimistic, and so are my people. I have come here today to explain why and to ask for your help. The Paris Agreement that we all fought so hard to achieve is a balanced, fair, and durable agreement. It is a ringing endorsement of multilateralism. It will stand the test of time. The agreement gives countries flexibility to determine their own contributions towards fighting climate change in the context of collective science-based goals. The agreement will bring countries together every five years to take stock of progress towards achieving those goals with a view to raising ambition. The agreement provides for transparency and accountability and sets out provisions relating to means of implementation, adaptation, and loss and damage. Importantly, the agreement recognizes that the national circumstances of countries must be considered in its implementation. It took us well over 20 years to achieve the Paris Agreement. We cannot do better, and we don't have the luxury of more time. The agreement is not open to renegotiation. Almost 150 countries have now joined the agreement. Some 50, including more than a quarter of the G20 since the U.S. election. No one else is walking away. In fact, they are doing the opposite. Some have joined in the last few days. I have been overwhelmed in recent weeks by the widespread global support and commitment to the Paris Agreement, including leaders, governments, cities, regions, and business community and individuals. I commend Italy for its climate leadership in the G7 and expect no less of Germany in the G20. Such collective acts of leadership and critical, are critical and must not fall by the wayside. Apart from the moral case for climate action, the economic case is undeniable. A recent OECD report highlights in no uncertain terms that any delay in climate action is bad for the economy. Growing numbers of decision makers at all levels see this. Real world climate action is accelerating and exceeding national targets. Who could have predicted only a few years ago that renewable energy would increasingly be the cheapest option? Climate action simply makes sense at every level. This realization is resulting in new countries emerging on climate, as climate champions, including India and China.
We are also seeing countries come together to find new ways to push the boundaries of climate ambition. The High Ambition Coalition, which my country established with the European Union and others, was key to reaching the deal in Paris. That coalition, which bridges traditional economic and geopolitical divides, is now working towards the full implementation of the Paris Agreement and the creation of the political space needed for deeper and faster climate action. In September next year, my country will take over leadership of the Climate Vulnerable Forum, a group of 48 developing countries that has pledged to go 100% renewable by 2050. If we can do that, so can you. At the sub-national level, we are seeing an unstoppable groundswell of collective commitment to climate action. Initiatives include the Under Two Coalition, the 2050 Platform, Mission 2020, the C40 Group of Cities, and the We Mean Business Coalition. Statements of commitment from U.S. states, cities, and businesses in the last week is to be welcomed, and so is the direct engagement of European nations with them. As the U.N. Secretary General recently said, the climate action train has truly left the station. But for a country like mine, there is an urgent time imperative, a cost-effective path to achieving the 1.5 degree limit requires peaking global emissions before 2020 and a rapid acceleration of climate action before 2020, so as to set the world towards net zero emissions in the second half of this century. The IEA has confirmed this rapid decarbonization is possible but requires un unprecedented levels of leadership. So once again, the world is looking to Europe. Thankfully, you have good track record. From the Kyoto Protocol and delivering on its implementation to securing the Durban Mandate that led to the Paris Agreement and ensuring the success of Paris itself, including bringing it into force in record time, Europe has been at the center of it all. Indeed, in Paris, it was the Marshall Islands and the European Union that marched arm in arm with others into the historic plenary or the final plenary. With that in mind, I pay tribute to President Ankar, Commissioner Arias Kanyete, and other European leaders and ministers over the years for their commitment. They are true climate warriors as are many of you who grace this chamber and others around the world. Domestically, Europe is demonstrating that economic growth and reducing emissions of greenhouse gases are both possible and mutually reinforcing. Your groundbreaking legislation and policies are being emulated by others around the world. Leadership must increasingly be about implementation you are turning rhetoric into reality and beginning to put in place what is needed to deliver on your Paris promises. The EU and its member states together provide about 40% of all global public climate finance. The EU is also the biggest provider of technical climate assistance to developing countries. An important example is the NTC partnership. In my country, the EU support has on its own helped solarize more than 90% of our outer islands. Every penny is being put to good use. For all of this, I say thank you for your leadership and for your example. Going forward, what must climate leadership from Europe look like? First, Europe must urgently communicate the 2050 strategy to reduce emissions consistent with the 1.5 degrees limit 
and net zero emissions in the second half of the century. I have already committed my country to doing so. Second, in 2018, the world will come together to consider progress and inform countries in coming forward with new or revised nationally, nationally determined contributions in 2020. The EU must approach this dialogue open to the possibility of raising its ambition as a result. We will not stay with, within 1.5 degrees unless Europe and others move before 2020 to raise ambition. So I am pleased to see President Macron has already committed France to doing even more and welcoming similar statements by Prime Minister Modi of India and others. This is exactly the race to the top we need. The 2018 dialogue together with the Climate Action Summit which California plans to host next September, and the UN Secretary General Climate Summit of World Leaders in 2019 are the three biggest political moments we have before the end of this decade to push the, climate, to push the cause of increased climate ambition. Europe must be at the center of this, working with countries and others around the world to ensure further and faster climate action by all. Third, I urge you to move to five-year international targets. Ten-year targets risk locking in low ambition and are less responsive to the latest science and technological developments. Fourth, the European Union must continue to push ambitions, ambitious climate action in all relevant fora and sectors including on shipping emissions and ensuring environmental integrity in reducing aviation emissions. It will also be important to push for the Kigali amendments on HFCs to enter into force as soon as possible. My country has already ratified the amendment. I acknowledge the sustained leadership of the Federated States of Micronesia to this important cause. The EU must also lead the world in mainstreaming climate action to deliver the sustainable development goals, including in relation to oceans. I pay tribute to our Pacific cousins from Fiji, as well as Sweden, for their leadership. All Pacific Islands are also extremely proud that Fiji will represent us when it leads the world at COP23, the first island's climate summit. Finally, ongoing, ongoing leadership of the EU on climate finance, in particular for the most vulnerable countries, will be critical. Support for implementation by developing countries is a crucial part of the Paris Agreement. Sadly, the U.S. decision to stop GCF funding presents a problem, and one we hope the EU and its allies can address. Bilateral assistance will also continue to be vital for countries like mine. An even greater focus by the EU on the Pacific region is urgently needed. In concluding, I note that some people, maybe even some in this room, think that it is impossible to achieve the goals we agreed in Paris. That is to say that my country cannot be saved. It is impossible to explain how it feels, as the leader of my people, to see reports or commentary that apparently forecast the oblivion of our homeland, our Jolit Jananich. I have seen and experienced the forced relocation and migration of my fellow citizens to other parts of the Marshall Islands and beyond as a consequence of the testing of nuclear weapons. So the responsibility my genera generation has to leave to our children and to their children and grandchildren the Marshall Islands as a secure place to call home weighs heavily. Failure is not an option. 
As our young climate warriors eloquently put it, quote, we are not drowning, we are fighting, unquote. I think I speak for all of my Pacific sisters and brothers when I say that. By working together, the Marshall Islands, the European, European Union, and many others have achieved the impossible before. And we will achieve it again, because we must. For your leadership, past, present, and future, I say komoltada. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mrs. President. The President of Marshall Island will be with us because I think also for her it is important to know our position and we want to be at the center of the debate on the climate change. We start with the first speech in name of the Council, the Minister Ellen Nadali. You have the floor. Thank you, President Tajani, President Hein, President Juncker, Commissioner. The recent announcement by President Donald Trump to withdraw the United States from the Paris Agreement on Climate is a highly regrettable step. The announcement is in line with previous actions by the new U.S. administration on environmental regulation such as the rolling back of existing climate programs and the weakening of international climate commitments. The decision to withdraw has been taken in the face of many convincing arguments in support of the new international framework and its architecture, voiced by the international community, businesses and other stakeholders. Unfortunately, at this point, the details of the US approach are still unclear. However, what has become evident now is the fact that the U.S. withdrawal adds to the global responsibility held by the European Union as the key supporter of a rules-based multilateral system. Let me stress here that the EU is committed to lead with ambitious climate policies and through our committed support to the poor and the vulnerable. Ladies and gentlemen, the Paris Agreement is fit for purpose. It is ambitious, yet not prescriptive. With its flexible architecture, it constitutes an international framework which encourages countries to widen the array of options contributing to the goals of, pre of preventing climate change which threatens global development, peace and stability. Therefore, the Council is committed to ensuring that the EU significantly contributes to the operation of the Paris Agreement and to the design of all the elements of the Paris outcome. Our goal should be to minimize the consequences of the U.S. decision on the effectiveness and credibility of the climate framework. The EU will also continue to support the convergence between intergovernmental negotiations and the implementation agenda. This includes the conversion of countries' nationally determined contributions goals into concrete policies and actions. Honourable Members, the Council continues its work on the completion of the internal legislative and regulatory framework of the Union, which is necessary to deliver our Paris target of reducing economy-wide emissions by at least 40% by 2030. 
by 2030. On 19 June, the, the Environmental Council will hold an exchange of views on the effort sharing and the land use, land use change and forestry emissions proposals. We hope to swiftly finalise the Council's position and to start our interinstitutional negotiations as soon as possible. The EU position following President Trump's decision to withdraw the US from the COP21 climate agreement will also be discussed during the Foreign Affairs Council meeting on the 19th of June. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Dalli. And now, in name of the European Commission, the President of the European Commission, Mr. Jean-Claude Juncker. Mr. President, Madam President, Madam President of the Council, distinguished members, when I addressed the Paris Conference in November 15, I saw the world united around a simple goal, to hand over to future generations a healthier planet, more stable, fairer societies and more prosperous and modern economies. Thanks to the negotiations, and in, partic in particular to the chief negotiator of the European Union, my good friend Miguel Cañete, a historic deal was made. The world agreed to save its one and only home. Doing justice to its traditional name, Gifts from God, the Marshall Islands took action becoming one of the first to ratify the Paris Agreement. The testimony of President Heine is a reminder of the need for action. It is a matter of survival. Here is a fact. Every morning, the international dateline sets that the day begins at the Marshall Islands. Madam President, we will work to help your country continue to mark the beginning of our days. We will not allow the denial of the very few to be the end of the days of the Marshall Islands. Unfortunately, not everyone in the world sees the truth of facts. The withdrawal of the United States from the Paris Agreement is more than a sad event. It is a, signing, uh, is a sign of abdication from common action in dealing with the fate of our planet. We are disappointed and we regret that decision. But the abandonment of Paris by the US administration will not mean the end of the agreement. I'm convinced that it will make the rest of the world more united and determined to work towards the full implementation of the Paris Agreement. The European Union will not renegotiate the Paris Agreement. The 29 articles... The 29 articles of the agreement must be implemented and not renegotiated. Climate action does not need more distractions. We have spent 20 years negotiating. Now is the time for action. Now is the time for implementation. I see a strengthened resolve from all those who care about the future of the planet and to see the opportunities of a modern economy. This includes partners within the United States, such as states of California, Washington, New York, which taken together would be the, world for the world's fourth economy. As European Union, we'll step up our climate diplomacy and collaboration with other partners. For instance, climate action was a key topic of the EU-China summit on the 2nd of June. In September, Miguel Cañete will co-host a major gathering with his Chinese and Canadian counterparts to implement Paris and accelerate the clean energy transition. We are also reaching out to our partners in the African Union and the ACP countries. And uh, we adopted joint statements expressing our common resolve. And we will work hard to have a clear message coming out of the G20 summit in July, or at least from 19. In Paris, the world committed to help the vulnerable uh, countries adopt the consequences of climate change. The decision of the US to go back on its pledge to the Green Climate Fund leaves a major void. From our side, we stand firm to our commitments and will work 
with third countries to mobilise the right public and private investments. You can count on the efforts of the Commission to keep the momentum behind Paris implementation. In return, we hope to count on your support to make the European Union's commitments a reality and make swift progress on all Commission uh, proposals related to that goal. When we ratified the Paris Agreement in record speed, this House showed its commitment to climate action. We need to keep the same spirit more than ever. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And now, the President of the European Party, People's Party Group, Manfred Weber. You have the floor. Sehr geehrte Frau Präsidentin, ich möchte zunächst uh, zum Ausdruck Madam bringen, President, dass wir geehrt sind durch Ihre Anwesenheit, durch Ihre Rede. Ein herzliches Willkommen. Es steht bei der Frage, wie wir mit den Entscheidungen von Donald Trump umgehen, zunächst eine ganz well, banale Frage im Raum, nämlich die Frage, wie halten wir es mit Fakten? Wie gehen wir mit Tatsachen? Die großen amerikanischen Universitäten, Harvard, Stanford, Georgetown, Yale und sogar 82 Prozent der amerikanischen Bürger bringen zum Ausdruck, and dass für sie klar ist, dass Klimawandel eine Realität ist. Für uns ist es is genauso klar, der Wandel kommt, er wird It's groß, er wird dramatisch, und es geht um die Frage, wie stark wir ihn begrenzen können mit gemeinsamen and the question is how we can limit Wir als Europäer dürfen stolz sein, dass wir mit anderen we gemeinsam die driving force waren, vorangegangen sind und den Paris-Vertrag erst möglich gemacht haben. The, uh, Paris die Europäer werden deswegen Europeans den Ausstieg Amerikas nicht akzeptieren. Not going to nicht sit back and the exit of the die emotionale Frage, die im Raum steht, ist, wie reagiert man darauf? Zunächst natürlich mit etwas Frustration is how der we respond right now. Of course, we respond immediately with frustration Aber to developments in the dann, US. Wenn man But ein paar Sekunden darüber nachdenkt, auch umso mehr Entschiedenheit, die uh, then I think that increases the, uh, wegen der Verantwortung für die folgenden Generationen und auch wegen des Wissens, dass die Frage des Klimawandels auch einen Modernisierungsschub für unsere Wirtschaft anstoßen wird. Selbst amerikanische Konzerne wie Exxon sprechen sich ja dafür aus, dass man die Klimaziele nicht aufgibt, weil sie erkennen, dass darin auch eine große Chance besteht, wenn wir es mit der Wirtschaft anpacken, diesen Wandel anzustoßen. Donald Trump negiert die Fakten. Donald Trump entscheidet sich gegen den Willen seiner eigenen US-Bürger, Donald Trump, Donald Trump is deciding against the wishes, wishes of his own citizens. Diesen, Donald diesen, Trump is not uh, going to create uh, a single new job with these uh, decisions. Donald Trump, with this Donald Trump, with this decision, is taking Fehler. a huge America historical uh, wrong step. America first is American uh, selfishness. America first is all about cutting off mein, relations. Uh, Europe first entgegenstellen. Und so maybe Europe we should first talk about Europe first instead. That Europe first means partnership, Probleme lösen working wollen. together, und trying to solve problems together. Europa That's America why Europe first und mehr needs Europe a little first. bit less Dankeschön. America first and a bit more Europe first. Thank you very much, Mr. Weber. And now the president of the Socialist Group, Mr. Gianni Pittella. Grazie. Signora Ein. Thank you. Grazie innanzitutto. Dr. Heiner, thank you very much. La bellezza e la vulnerabilità you talked about della, the beauty and vulnerability sono la cifra del nostro Islands. pianeta. And e sono le direzioni opposte verso le quali possiamo andare. Example of Grazie alle nostre scelte o a causa delle nostre go. scelte. Possiamo andare verso la bellezza, la salute e la sicurezza del pianeta, ma possiamo andare anche verso il disastro. Un tweet, lui ama i tweet, a Donald Trump. Non pensavo che ci potesse essere presidente peggiore degli Stati Uniti di George Bush. E devo ricredermi, perché non c'è mai limite al peggio. Ha raggiunto l'apice del peggio, spero non lo superi. Sta conducendo verso il disastro il pianeta, ma noi lo fermeremo. Look at the future of the planet. It's up to us to come together as progressives. Progressive people worldwide need to come together as different European groupings. We need to come together and take account of the different social, political, institutional, associative, non-governmental possibilities for organisations so that we can get together and stop the Trump disaster in its tracks. Europe needs to build 
Europe, as it has in the past, as we did in previous years, as we did when we built the single market. We had an aim, we achieved it. We need a grand aim now. We should not be naive. We need to look reality in the face. Trump wants to reduce the cost of US production. That's basically what he wants to do, and that is unfair competition. We need countermeasures. We should be thinking about imposing duties. We should be thinking about what we can do to tackle unfair competition, because when you're faced with unfair competition, you have to do something to fight back. We want to preserve life, beauty, health for our children and grandchildren across the whole world. Thank you, Mr. Pitella. We do have a lot on the agenda today. We have two special guests today, so neither I nor Vice Presidents will be giving any blue cards today. We'll have to wait to catch the eye. Now for the European Conservatives and Reformist Group, Ms. Gelling. Thank you very much. And thank you, Madam President, for coming here today and for your clear leadership and inspiration to the High Ambition uh, Group. Well, for those of us who have struggled perhaps a little bit with how to address Donald Trump, uh, what tone to adopt towards him, after all, he's a legitimately elected world leader, well, he's now solved my problem because I'm very happy to publicly and loudly say that this and his, his action is reckless, it's myopic, and it's totally irresponsible. And it's made even more contemptible by the fact that we now know that in, he's decided that climate change is real. He stopped his denying of it. He says it's real, and indeed his ambassador to the UN, Nikki Haley, has, con has confirmed that for us. So that makes his decision even more contemptible. He's not even pretending anymore that he doesn't believe in climate change. We also can see that he has a complete misunderstanding of the Paris Agreement and what uh, the US's obligations are under that agreement. He seems to think that it will be giving US industry an extremely unfair position and totally ignoring the fact that actually it gives the US a huge amount of flexibility in how they deal with making sure that they uh, stand up for their obligations. And given the modest commitments that the U.S. is being asked to make, let's face it, for many people, um, what the U.S. is being asked under Paris is actually still way underperforming Europe and many of the member states in Europe. It seems even more the case that uh, the Donald should be asked exactly where he gets his information and his advice from. Because rather with, with higher per capita emissions than the world average, the U.S. has a moral duty to significantly reduce its emissions and ensure that global average temperatures remain below 2 degrees C. Ne maybe we should say that the next human-caused climate disasters should be called Hurricane Donald, Super Drought Pruitt, or Tropical Cycle Bannon, because that's going to be his legacy. <laughs> Thank you. And now, in the name of the group ALDE, the Liberals, Mrs. Berder, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. President Trump is not the only threat to our global environment and the beautiful island states such as yours, Madam President, and thank you for coming to talk to us. Climate change skeptics in the UK also threaten European global protection. The British e elections delivered a disastrous result for our Prime Minister, and Mrs May battles on. She's appointed a new Environment Secre Secretary, Mr Michael Gove. Now, Gove has a shocking record. When he was Education Secretary, Gove wanted to get climate change off the school curriculums. He voted to sell off all of England's publicly owned and protected forests and woodlands. He's voted 12 times against measures to prevent climate change, including opposing limits on greenhouse gas emissions. He supports fracking and he supports drilling in national parks. He's opposed refitting homes to stop carbon loss. To quote a past colleague of, of this house, Caroline Lucas, who is now an MP, Michael Gove is an environmental disaster waiting to happen. 
During the Brexit referendum campaign, Gove stated he's had enough of experts. Well, frankly, the experts and the public have had enough of him too, just as they have had of President Trump. Colleagues, please be tough during the Brexit negotiations when it comes to the environment, as you will be with Mr. Trump. Climate deniers like Gove need to know they have international treaty commitments that they cannot evade. He will try to slip and slide on environmental agreements. So, given the election result last week, it remains to be seen whether the UK will actually leave the EU. But if we do, the UK, just like the US, must fulfil its international environmental obligations. Environmental challenges do not stop at borders. Our environment... Our planet is interlinked, especially when it comes to the most vulnerable states on the planet. We must work together to protect it in the UK, in the USA, and of course, driven here by European Union. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Now for the Confederal Group, the European United Left Monday Green Left, Ms. Konetskna. Thank you, Mr. President. Dear colleagues, and uh, first of all, uh, Madam President, uh, thank you uh, for coming to our midst and thank you to, uh, for your words. Donald Trump has decided to withdraw uh, from the Climate Accord of Paris. Apparently, he would like to go back to the Middle Ages when uh, scientifically verifiable facts were denied on a daily basis. Unfortunately, in spite of all uh, his tweets, uh, climate change is unstoppable. And as we've heard today, the whole nations and uh, states are threatened by this uh, process that brings about rising sea levels and harsh droughts. Climatic changes caused by man may uh, trigger a migration wave of such size in the coming years that the current crisis will seem banal in comparison. What Mr. Trump wants to do about this, he hasn't said. Apparently, he would be uh, fine with the role of an unrestrained ruler over wasteland. How far a uh, reckless use of resources and no protection of environment is illustrated daily by, for instance, the situation around palm oil in Indonesia. More than ever uh, today, we have to show the world our unity, determination and the right way forward. Co-chair of the Green Group, Skakella, please. Thanks very much, Madam President, for coming to coming on to see us today and for telling us about the impact of climate change for people in the most affected areas. I can only reassure you that we, the Greens, will work very hard indeed to get us to do more to fight against climate change. And I very much welcome the fact that many colleagues have spoken have also said, likewise, they support the Paris Agreement and they think that Mr. Trump's decision is wrong. But I don't think that's enough. It's not enough to criticize Mr. Trump uh, to, to take the moral high ground that we're better than Mr. Trump, because the objectives that we've uh, committed to, that we've heard about from the Commission, are based on an optimistic scenario. They're not a guarantee that if we keep things below two degrees, but for islands such as uh, yours, uh, Dr. Hein, no, that's not enough. We've got to keep it below. 1.5 maximum should be the objective. Only then will these islands have a possibility of surviving. So we need to do more. We Europeans, we are the third largest emitter of CO2. So we have the ability and responsibility as well as technology to do something about climate change. We're not the poorest countries in the world. Far from it. We've got the wherewithal and so we've got to do something. We can show leadership and be in the vanguard in contributing to stemming climate change. When uh, we can't, we, we're going to, we can't just let Mr. Trump to wash his hands of this. We've got to offset what the U.S. doesn't do. We can't, to, we can't say to future generations, well, we couldn't do more because Mr. Trump didn't want to play along. We in the Parliament and also member states' governments, and I'm particularly thinking of the uh, German uh, government uh, need to do more because 
because uh, Germany is also a huge polluter. What about the uh, rules on das car emissions in Germany, that kind of thing? So look at those details. This isn't, these don't fit Chance in with a, playing a leadership Energie role. We've got an opportunity Energie with renewables, with energy efficiency, to generate real jobs, jobs for the future. It requires political courage. We've got to show that the planet can't wait for us. We can't live without the planet. We can't live without a, a climate that allows survival. So let's do something. Thank you. Thank you very much. The President of the Marshall Islands and me, we, we, we are leaving the, the plenary. Thank you, Mrs. President, for your engagement. Thank you for, for your speech. Thank you for the cooperation with the European Union. The European Union and the European Parliament will support your position. Thank you very much. And so, colleagues, we continue the debate, and I now give the floor for one minute to Madame de Matto. Thank you very much, President. Well, according to some calculations that have come from the United States, we could have 1.4 million tons of CO2 released as a result until 2020. That will damage the economy and agriculture. These are huge numbers, and we can't simply pretend that nothing is happening. This is the time of the fourth uh, industrial revolution, the circular economy, the 2030 agenda, the, the Paris Agreement. This is the ideal place for us to plan for a more sustainable future. Thank you. The Uni European Union has got responsibilities not only to its own people but also to uh, less developed countries around the world. It's now time for us to take a central role in scientific and technological terms to increase investments in the sector. But if this is the Europe of Dieselgate and the financing of the fossil fuel through FC and the uh, ECB ensure that uh, what we need first is a change of the political climate. Thank you. I now give the floor for one minute to Mr. Wilimski. Microphone, please. Micro, excuse me. Ladies and gentlemen, there's so many noble defenders of the climate. But going at the garage and you see these uh, expensive uh, cars uh, with high capacity. So lo look at what the European Parliament really does. We fly all over the world to discuss important issues such as gender mainstream. And that's all fantastic. But of course, if it's USA bashing, Trump bashing, the hypo hypocrisy knows no limits. Look at this climate agreement. Well, look, Monsanto was, at, was there at the table. So was the nuclear lobby. Out at the end of the day, it's basically us kowtowing to the nuclear industry, uh, promoting uh, renewables. Well, what about that? Please be honest about climate change, nature protection. Please stop the hypocrisy. Thank you. Thank you. For one minute, Mr. Golnisch. President Trump's decision to take the U.S. out of the Paris Agreement has given rise to worldwide reactions. The President of Goldman Sachs wasn't particularly known for being concerned about the environment previously, but he's condemned it too. My own view is that the Paris Agreement is very has very little in terms of legally binding elements, and ensuring that signatories implement it is also very difficult. It's more of a political declaration. And at any rate, it's only 2020 that uh, we will be reaching a stage when uh, we will depend on the U.S. to do this. Big city states have already said that they will do this. Uh, so if it's lucrative to invest in the green economy and the related, economy, uh, related uh, economic sectors, then business will do that. So I'm not so concerned about that. What I'm concerned about is the possibility of Europe 
then say, let's offset the, the US withdrawal and impose limits on our own economy. Mr. Pitello was talking about customs duties to deal with unfair competition from the US. I hope that he will be showing the same view in other circumstances. Colleagues, I do have to be strict on time, so with that, um, I will give the floor to Madame Grostet for one and a half minutes. Thank you, Madame Grostet. Thank you very much, Madam President. Well, nobody can now say that they didn't know anything about climate change. We've seen repeated natural catastrophes. We've seen whole territories affected. We've seen uh, poor people getting poorer. There's rising sea levels affecting islands and coastlines. We've seen droughts and famines in uh, East Africa. That's the reality, and they could lead to an exodus of the thousands, if not millions, of people, not to mention the, the dangers to biodiversity as well. Trump's withdrawal from the uh, Paris Agreement is an irresponsible decision that will harm his own country, preventing Americans from entering the modern age, protecting our environment, and the technological revolution it will lead to is modernity. Our companies need to seize this opportunity. They will invest to quickly get access to the most effective effective technologies and they have our support and that's the best way to defend jobs as well. The Paris Agreement was a worldwide success. Europe has committed itself to a clear and visionary path to defending the climate and, that, and uh, if we hear from some people in this house saying that legislation goes too far, no, we're ambitious and responsible for future generations. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Van Brempt, one and a half minutes. Thank you, Thank you very much, uh, dear colleagues. Um, um, President Trump made his announcement to leave the Paris Agreement, ironically, in the Rose Garden. And the question is, how should we react? We can be very angry, we can be frustrated, but let's not be afraid and let's stand united. Um, as we heard a lot of uh, our political leaders in Europe say that we would keep up the engagements in the Paris Agreement. But it's good to give good speeches. That's very nice. But the Proof of the pudding is in the eating. And the first thing we need to do in Europe is implement the Paris Agreement to the full. So when we have an, uh, a vote uh, on, uh, on the effort share, when we will discuss the renewable energy, when we will discuss energy efficiency, let's move up and make it more ambitious. That is our goal. Second, um, um, we always say that Europe is divided, two speeds, three speeds. Well, we can say at least in the States we have more than one speed. We have the Trump administration, but we also have states, cities, mayors, companies that go ahead, that said they will implement the Paris Agreement and they will keep on track on that. And so let's not turn our back on the United States and their people, but work together with these cities and these states. And that is, I think, what the European Commission should do as well. Make sure that at an international state we keep up with China, India, but also with the citizens of the United States because, let, let us be rest assured, Trump is not the rightful represent, representative of the people in the United States because they do stand with um, uh, the Paris Agreement and with uh, combating climate change. Thank you. Thank you. For one minute, Mr. Henkel. Ladies and gentlemen, in his television series, Trump tended to get rid of his candidates with the words, you're fired. A man running a country like a company is what we're witnessing, and I'm somebody who worked in industry for my entire life, but this is not how you are supposed to run a country basing things, products on old technology, basing himself on alternative facts, and instead of thinking about the long-term well-being of his companies, it's being based on short-term objectives. So, ladies and gentlemen, if I were chairman of that particular company, I would say to Mr. Trump tomorrow, you're fired. Thank you. For one minute, Madam Matthias. 
Obrigada, Presidente. Thank you, o facto President. de Donald Trump the ter abandonado o Acordo de Paris Trump é uma má notícia para todos nós. Mas para concordamos para todos com todos. isto, temos de ser coerentes. But we agree that we e need por isso quero aqui deixar um apelo. And that's why Ainda há poucos dias votámos appeal. na Comissão I3, a, few days ago, a posição deste committee, Parlamento sobre o dossiê do UCF e ganhou o lobby do negócio da floresta. And the, the forestry lobby won the day. Não põe apenas em causa o Acordo de Paris, como faz recuar a própria legislação europeia em matéria de combate às alterações climáticas. É por isso que apelo a este Parlamento, a Comissão Europeia e ao Conselho, que façam a transposição do Acordo de Paris com um déficit sem truques na tabela das emissões e sem hipocrisia. Não podemos contar apenas as árvores que são plantadas e ignorar aquelas que são cortadas. Ainda estamos a ver as árvores que estamos a plantar and ignore the ones that we've cut down. The time is passing. So I call on all the institutions to ensure that Lulu CF reflects the Paris Agreement rather than um, constituting backpedaling on uh, our climate change commitments. One minute, Mr. Eichhaus. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you everyone for these uh, heartbreaking speeches on climate change. It's really great to hear how everyone is involved in it and concerned and Well, let's see, in half an hour you can vote and you will add loopholes to our own climate legislation watering down our targets for 2030. There might be some inconsistency with some of you guys, but, but let's, let's, I, I'm, I'm sure you're going to work on that. I also want to thank the Council for being there because uh, you've been listening to uh, the, the Marshall Islands. I know that you are even worse on the effort sharing regulation. You are pleading for more loopholes all over the place. I really hope when the Environment Council is there next week, you really have still in your mind the speech of the Marshall Islands and act like it. And I think that is important. And to the Commission, um, one of the clear demands we got from the Marshall Islands, come now with your 2050 roadmap now before 2018. Are you going to do that or is this indeed for the next Commission? Postponing, postponing. I silence now because I'm going to listen to Mr. Helmer and if I understand the Guardian right, you're going to step down in July, so this will be your final speech. I'm happy to listen to it. <laughs> and your final speech will be for one minute, Mr. Helmer. Uh, Madam President, may I from this hemicycle send congratulations to President Trump for his wisdom and courage in pulling America out of the uh, climate agreement in Paris uh, and resisting the pressure from the Green Lobby, of, her, of which we've heard so much uh, today. Uh, in fact, he has given America a huge competitive advantage in terms of industry and exports, which will be damaging to Europe if we cling to the outmoded climate uh, passion that we've heard uh, in this hemicycle. Some colleagues will be familiar with the peer-reviewed paper published re recently by Danish statistician Bjorn Lomborg in which he estimates the cost of Paris at $100 billion by the end of the century uh, when the impact on climate will be 0.17 degrees. In other words, an eye-watering amount of money for virtually no return. This is pure virtue signalling and gesture politics. We should be ashamed of ourselves. <laughs> Madam Atkinson, one minute. Last month, colleagues from across six nations at this side of the House wrote to President Trump urging him to pull out of the Paris Climate Agreement, and he did. He's putting American jobs first, he's fighting against global interests, he's protecting the nation state, he's trying to protect his citizens from terror. He's a president that has the guts to stand up to the global elites and their green hobbies. He puts American people first, instead of virtual signaling with other people's money. Trump's policies, like Brexit, has really challenged the status quo in this place, and that's why you're all so frustrated now. So good luck, President Trump. I wish you well, along with Steve Bannon, your chief strategist. You're winning. We're winning, despite the rhetoric that goes on and despite uh, uh, Mrs May really messing up. But I'm sure all my colleagues across this House would like to join me in wishing President Trump a very happy birthday. Mr. Lisa, one minute. Well, 
President, it was my great honor to participate on the European Parliament delegation to the Climate Conference in Marrakech, and there was obviously a big shock when it became known that Mr. Trump had won the election because uh, we had to reckon on this particular development, but it was clear, even back in Marrakech, that the rest of the world would not be deceived and would stick to Paris. I would like to thank Jean-Claude Juncker and Mr. Kenyatta for their clear statements on that. And this Parliament will not only talk but act. Bas Eichhardt has unfortunately just left, has been talking about loopholes, but let's not deceive ourselves that we are voting today on effort sharing and the EPP is voting on the compromise which sets for, uh, an, an ambitious goal for the implementation of Paris, which is also realistic but ambitious. And I'm delighted that after discussions in my group we agreed on that. Protecting the climate gives an opportunity for industry and Trump is going to suffer the effects of that because he's been missing out on the future. Thank, Thank you very much. You. One and a half minutes now. Madam Daly. Thanks a lot, uh, Chair, um, Commissar, Minister. Commissioner, Minister, I stand here as a concerned citizen, representing all concerned citizens, wanting change in regards to climate action. I sometimes listen to the speeches in this uh, room, and I can't believe my ears because there are those who cannot even realise that if the world's ecosystem die, then, then the economy, world economies will go with them. When we were negotiating the Paris Agreement, I felt there was a consensus where we could act together to save our planet. And I was hopeful that we were on the dawn of a complete revolution that could bring about change within our lifetime. President Trump's decision to withdraw from the Paris Agreement, we have to admit, is a blow to common sense. However, this setback will not deflect from our resolve to act. We need to lead, inspire, and empower. This is the time for bold action. The time where we decide as one united continent on which side of history we want to be. This is an issue which directly impacts people's rights. We're talking about the right to food, the right to clean water, health, education, education and shelter and security. These are the most vulnerable people who are not even contributing to uh, climate change and we have to be, so, um, we have to be solidar show solidarity. Thank you. One minute, Madam Wisnowska. Thank you so much, um, Madam President, colleagues. The Paris Agreement gives to each of the parties the possibility to apply its own conditions. It doesn't say no to uh, carbonization. It uh, doesn't take account of the issue of forests, uh, focuses on sustainable development. However, after the US decided to withdraw, the European Union's uh, climate policy should be revised. But I would like to put a word of caution. Uh, let's make sure we don't act one-sided only. We don't put our ambitions too high to, in a way, fill the gap left when the US left. When we act alone, we won't save the world. To the contrary. I believe that the European industry as a result will be even less competitive. So, Mr. Commissioner, I would like to call on you to make sure that the Paris Agreement remains the fundament of European climate policy that does not assume decarbonization, that appreciates the role of forests in the overall CO2 balance, and that focuses on a sustainable development. Thank you. One minute now, Mr. Jadot. Merci, Madame la Présidente. Uh, quelle belle unanimité, Thank you, Madam President. Uh, what Trump wonderful unanimity here in Parliament against Trump. Trump His decision is indeed irresponsible. It's criminal. Si but frankly, sur le et sur if speeches on the planet, climate and the environment could save the, the planet, we would know about it by now. The credibility la of climate diplomacy and leadership is to be found in environmental action. And all too often, the Commission 
Nation and Council and the right wing of this House lends too big an ear to the nuclear, petrol, gas, intensive farming, forestry, transport lobbies. You don't see all the SMEs, the researchers, the startups, the citizens, those involved in connectivity who want to do more for the climate and are today working to build tomorrow as well. So what you need to do if it wants to reconcile itself with the climate is to create jobs. We can win Europeans back to Europe if we do that and reconcile us with the rest of the world. So take action, action, action. One minute, Madam Arna, too. President, in this um, uh, air-conditioned hemicycle, this umpteenth condemnation of the U.S. president is hypocritical. It's like the Saudis uh, denouncing uh, Qatar and the jihadists. Uh, he's a democratically elected head of state. He's never hid, hidden his um, um, scepticism uh, with regard to climate change. And he clearly is taking up arms against unemployment and um, terrorism. Um, whereas we are um, working away on the, the climate to, to the expense of those things. And we should be tackling unemployment and recognize that again we're losing competitiveness vis-à-vis uh, -vis our, 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 our strong, um, strong competition from the U.S. Now, um, Trump, this was um, an agreement which was not uh, binding in legal terms, and what he's done is doing what's best for his citizens, and that's so difficult for um, you to accept, given the fact that you've got such a different mindset. Madam Valian, one minute. Thank you. Madam President, I think it's fair to say that there is an uh, agreement in uh, this House that we need to continue to fulfill our commitments for the Paris Agreement. And this will be seen, I hope, in the vote which is following on effort sharing, which I hope will have the support of this House. The problem still resides in the support the member states are giving actually to the Paris Agreement targets because even if we adopt policies with ambition then we will have to have the support of the member states we need to implement this and uh, here the house this house cannot have a very good say we need the member states to put the money where they promised they will put the money and to implement these policies we are agreeing upon because the weakness of the agreement lies in its voluntary nature. So the implementation will depend very much on how the global economy will fare. And the Paris Agreement, we need